Oke, okay. bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning everyone. I hope we are healthy and good condition today. Still with me, Miftar Mawadi as Master of Ceremony. Welcome back to our big event, International Conference, Quran and Hadith Studies with them. New Landscape on Quran and Hadith Studies, Challenges and Opportunities. Today, Wednesday on 10 of August 2022. Ladies and gentlemen, yesterday we have carried out opening ceremony, a ceremony, webinar for session, and the parallel session with our guest speaker, that is Professor Dr. Abdul Majid Hakimullahi, and then Dr. Adi Studerija, and then Dr. Abdul Hakim Wahid MA, and then Mrs. Liswa Santosa Aisyah MA. And today, we come back to continue our event, that is webinar second session, and parallel session with our guest speakers, that is Professor Dr. Hamidullah Marazi, and then Associate Professor Moon Imsiri PhD, and then Dr. Lili Umi Kalsum MA, and then Dr. Muhammad Zulfahmi, and then Mrs. Saadatul Jannah MA. Of course, will be uh, this event will be led by our moderator, Mr. Dr. Nofizal Wendry MA. Hello, Mr. Nofizal. How are you, Mr. Hello, Ma. I'm fine. Thank you very much for inviting me to be a moderator. Okay, Alhamdulillah. Are you ready, Mr.? Yes, I'm ready. Okay, thank you, Mr. So, to Mr. Dr. Novisal Wendry, MA, time is yours. Okay, thank you, Ma. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my, I have your attention. This international conference is about to begin. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alhamdulillah, wassalatu wassalamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa mawala. Excellencies, uh, distinguished speakers, conference committee, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the international conference on Quran and Hadith studies, uh, the fourth icon kuhas <coughs> webinar session by the team New Landscape on Quran and Hadith Studies, the Challenges and Opportunities. I'm Novizal, allow me as a moderator in this conference. Yesterday uh, is the first day uh, of our conference discuss uh, about Hadith Studies. And now, today, uh, our main topic revolves around the study of uh, Quran. However, it is possible that uh, memorize uh, also the study of hadith, maybe. Also, uh, from the point of view of the Quran, uh, Quran is solid likuli zaman wa makan, available in any time and places. Uh, most of its text is uh, global, not detailed, so that he can have dialogue or be brought closer to various discipline or approaches. As Abdullah Daro says uh, in Naba Al-Azim, Fanzur Haithu Shik Taim Al-Quran. Also, uh, Ibn Mas'ud said, Al-Quran Zalul Zu Wujuh Fahmiluhu Ala Ahsani Wujuhi. Uh, so that we invite uh, our five distinguished speakers uh, I will introduce them. Uh, first, uh, Professor Hamidullah Marazi. Uh, he is uh, he is uh, from Islamic University of Science and, and Technology, India. Uh, he finished uh, his uh, bachelor in Aligarh Muslim University, MA in Aligarh Muslim University, and PhD in University of Kashmir. He will talk about uh, he will talk about the Quran rationality and the and science. Uh, the second speaker is uh, Professor uh, Associate Professor Moon Im Siri PhD. Uh, he is from uh, University 
of Notre Dame USA. He will talk about current research avenues in Quranic and Hadith studies. Uh, and our third speakers, Ibu Lili Umi Kalsum, will talk about a trend of Tahfiz Al-Quran in Indonesia. And the fourth speaker, Mr. Dr. Muhammad Zulfahmi bin Muhammad, will uh, talk about pola pemikiran gerakan orientalis abad ke-18. And our last speaker, uh, Ibu Saadatul Jannah, MA, from University UN Sharif Hidayatullah, will talk about what should academic do for some cases of use and abuse of Quranic understanding. Okay, uh, that's a short introduction uh, uh, about our speaker. And let me invite uh, our first speaker, Professor Hamidullah Marozi. Time is yours, bro. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, dear friend Wenji, and all other professors and teachers from uh, Islamic University, Sharifullah University, Islamic University, uh, Indonesia. So it is a really a very a great occasion for us. Am I audible? Am I audible? Yes, 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 yes. Okay, yes we can. So uh, it is really a very great occasion for me to be among the scholars, professors, uh, and uh, uh, other such type of students uh, of Indonesia, uh, and especially from Jakarta uh, Islamic University, Pillar University that I am talking today about uh, uh, Quran, rationality, and science. So this is a very great conference, and uh, I congratulate uh, the university for organizing such a very important conference on a very important topic, Quran and Hadith, and what are the challenges and opportunities. So I have just uh, chosen the topic uh, today, the Quran, uh, uh, rationality, and science. There are some people who think that when you are just talking about religion, you do need to invoke reason. And uh, there is difference between science and religion, science and philosophy and religion. And I am challenging this uh, thesis that uh, religion has uh, always promoted uh, reason and also science. So it is because of religion that all the uh, you know, progress was made by Muslims in scientific field and in philosophical, you know, uh, areas. So in this way, religion has supported uh, always uh, uh, scientific inquiry and academic uh, activities rather than, you know, stalling at this progress of philosophy or science. So to start with, knowledge is an Im Im important uh, content of the Quran on a sheer word count, uh, as Rosenthal has observed, that ilm occurs about 70, 50, 750 times in Quran. All places in the Quran uh, which are uh, dealing with ilm, that means uh, occurs about 2,800 times. And Rob and Master occurs 950 times. So this shows that knowledge is one of the integral you know, topics of the Quran. Similarly, in light of the Quranic theory of knowledge, the relationship between the concepts of general epistemology, that is theory of knowledge, and those of Quranic uh, you know, uh, insistence of intellect and revelation. These are very important subjects of Quranic epistemology. This is the source of true knowledge, and according to the Veda, the goal of philosophy as understood by the ancient Gnostics is to purify intellect. That's akul. To possess wisdom, hikmah, is the same as the Quranic purification of intellect from gafla, the unconscious state, and hawa, that is desire. So Quran is just purifying uh, man's faculties of reason 
from ghafla and from uh, hawa that is desire and purifies it and makes it suitable for academic knowledge. Thus the Quranic epistemology does not contradict their philosophical regard for intellect, but purifies it in the light of divine guidance. That's Huda. Unlike the modern approach to rationality, which considers itself independent of revelation, in Islam, revelation and reason are very important and these are supporting each other. As has been mentioned by the Veda, according to uh, the traditional view that revelation, why and not intellect is the source of knowledge in Islam, appear simplistic in the light of Quranic position. The Quran never displaces intellect akal. Re, uh, revelation only purifies intellect from gafla and hawa that is there. Intellect akal thus becomes a reliable source of knowledge. Hence, we find numerous references in the Quran of two types of uh, reason, reasoning through gafla and hawa and reasoning through zikr and huda. Moreover, the Quran has used terms like akal, fikr, tafakku, tadabur, hikmah, and ilm, etc. in the context of an integrated world view. So these are the parts of Islamic worldview that is wealth and shown. The Holy Quran invites humankind to study closely the heavens and the earth, the diversity of animals, the diversity of tongues and colors of human systems, and the scheme of creation of the heavens and earth, wonders of nature, development stage of the human, humans, their balance and perfection in the universe. The importance of akal, that is reason, is further amplified in the very task of rigidly comprehending the message, or rightly the, uh, comprehending the uh, message of the revelation, because it is through intellect that man is addressed as God does not speak directly to man. So God is always, Allah is always addressing the mind of man rather than directly addressing man himself. So this is the medium of the guidance and uh, uh, knowledge for man to learn through his reason. Even Quran has laid emphasis on, you know, thinking and pondering when we are studying Quran. Have they not pondered over the Quran or there are locks on their hearts? The Holy Quran adds another dimension to the ancient concept of wisdom that sigma by referring to an order of reality, which the intellect uncle in its stage of purification cannot know. Here, revelation becomes truly a source of knowledge by bringing in the news that is Naba, which cannot be discovered by intellect. So there are several such type of subjects which cannot be understood by our reason. So those are brought to fore by uh, revelation. But we have been told by Allah at many uh, times in the Quran to accept uh, these all news about that world on the basis of revelation, but uh, appeal is made to the reason. Nabaul Ghaib, the news of the unseen, for example, resurrection, judgment, life after, and Nabaul Azim, the end of the world, fall under uh, this type of knowledge, as has been mentioned by Dr. Toshiko, is it so? God and man in the Quran. So, this is a very important book on the subject. Quranic epistemology involves also Tanzeem, Wahi, and Kitab ultimately refers to a purely Quranic concept, namely Ayat, signs, which are linguistic as well as non-linguistic. The linguistic signs are the very words in the Quran which are to be understood through Akal. They are differentiated into Muhkamat, that is categorical, and Mutashabiyat, allegorical. The category of Mutashabiyat is of very great significance because it involves the act of Taweel. So for Mutashabihat, we have to use the term, we have, the term Taweel has been used, and that is interpretation. And here the Holy Quran refers to two ways of conducting interpretation. One is based on ilm, that is knowledge, and another on mere zan, that is conjecture. But ayat signs are also non-linguistic, referring to the phenomenon of nature, which constitutes the framework of references for Asma that is names and amsal, that is example. The concept which the Quran bring, brings to bear upon this uh, uh, kind of science is that of figure, reflection, which connotes the conscious act of reflection or recovery. So here we can understand that 
On the one hand, there are uh, Bokhtamat, and on the other hand, there are Mutshabiyat. So Mutshabiyat can be just interpreted through Tawil, and these are one type of verses in which are found in the Quran, and then there are Mokhamat, and for Mokhamat, we need to use our reason, and that is Taqul. And we have to make, you know, tafsir of that. And for Mutashabiyat, we have to meet, make Tawi. We have to make Tawi. And then second point is that there are signs in the universe, which can be understood also through reason. And in this way, Quran again, again is, uh, you know, inviting humans to use their reason and believe in their revelation and see the universe. And in this way, go for the scientific exploration. As such, they could be called as the scientific verses of the Quran. All the verses which talk about the tafkir, these are the scientific verses of uh, Quran. It is he who has sent down to you, Muhammad Sallallahu the book that this is Quran. In it are verses that are inter in, uh, entirely clear. They are the foundations of the book, and those are the verses of Al Ahkam, commandments, etc. Al Faraiz, obligatory duties, and Al Hudud, that is legal laws for the punishment of thieves, adulterers, etc and others not entirely clear. So as for those in whose hearts there is a deviation from the truth, they follow that which is not entirely clear thereof. Seeking al-fitna, polytheism and trials, etc. And seeking for its hidden meanings, but none knows its hidden meanings save Allah. And those who are firmly grounded in knowledge say we believe in it, the whole of it. Uh, clear and uh, unclear verses are from our Lord and none receives uh, admonition except men of understanding. According to Rosenthal, everything tends to show that Muhammad Sassam did indeed attribute great significance to knowledge in the system of his religious thought. Uh, the role of Akal is in acquisition of knowledge cannot be underestimated. And when Akal is teaching, uh, reaching to the stage of uh, Tafakku, it becomes a source of Ijtihad, as has been said by Imam Ghazali and others. It is uh, a general term to call the medieval Hellenized Muslim philosophy or modern Western scientific attitude Islamic. As, so now there is one problem that sometimes we think that only at that time Muslims started you know, dealing with the philosophy and science when uh, Greek books were translated into Arabic. But I have just to, uh, thrown it that it was Quran and the Quranic verses which have just uh, encouraged Muslims to go for science and thinking and philosophy and uh, you know, uh, rational thought. However, the actual and real uh, Quranic epistemology will be that which is Islamic, not only in content, but in context also. Unlike the above mentioned Greek polytheistic thought or modern materialistic Western secular scientific version shown. Islam fortunately has not allowed science or philosophy to dominate religion as it has done in Western milieu or in some case in the context of some religions. These religions have become more and more philosophical in orientation and have lost the pragmatic morality and spiritual appeal, which has had been the hallmark of the phenomenon of religion down the ages. While as in the European context, it is science and not religion which is dictating terms to one and all. But in case of Islam, it has been always religion and Quran and Hadith, which have just guided Muslims to go for science and go for philosophy, and for that reason, our philosophy has been never divested or it has been never you know, segregated from revelation, from hikmah, from ilahiyya. As has been rightly said, unlike the West, where the battle was clearly won by science against religion, Islam in its modern thought seems to keep the debate alive between science and religion, between the human and divine source of knowledge, that is reason and revelation. Islam is an integral part of the universe, its laws and the articulation of the universe and its laws. However, since the science keeps on changing its theories, it cannot stand as a contending adversary of religion always. For example, what was certain hundred years ago is not rejected as unscientific. We may accept science only in its pure and applied form, provided it does not exceed its limits by trying to interpret philosophically what exists, but so far as Islam is concerned, so there is a set philosophy about science in Islam, which can be called as philosophy of science in Islam, and it will not deviate from that. So it will not be materialistic, it will not be atheistic, it will not be agnostic, but it will be tawhidic in it is, you know, all connotations and denotations. So Islamic philosophy of science is very clear. 
and it is revolving around the concept or the belief of Tawheed and it determines everything around it on the basis of this story declared and shown. Science and knowledge more or less has become synonymous in the context of the West, as every branch of knowledge has been made to serve the materialistic advance of modern man. There are two important developments which have taken place after religion was relegated to oblivion in the Western milieu. One was that science assumed the ultimate authority to determine truth and falsehood, and even suggested elimination of metaphysics as a particular state stage where ethics and ontology also becomes technologies and domains falling outside the purview of scientific verifiability principle and theology, the kingdom of darkness to quote Hobbes. But in case of Islam, science has been always supported by religion and uh, revelation. After assuming the role of a sole orbiter in West, science uh, redeveloped its own philosophy to replace the old metaphysics based on either religious thoughts or provide an alternative to religion itself after the collapse of the later, particularly in the context of the Western world, which however had very disastrous influence for the spiritual and religious traditions of the Eastern part of the world, also by implication. Same is the case with philosophy, which is based on speculation and can never stand the test of times as it keeps on changing. It is theories with every development in science and other thoughts. So, but in case of Islamic philosophy, it has its own permanent status and it is based on revelation and the reconciliation between reason and revelation. After elucidating the, elucidating the Islamic pattern shown in its metaphysical context at every stage, all the sciences fundamentally emanated from Islamic worldview, uh, which relate to Tawheed in their final analysis. Each branch of science has its own name, but all branches of science have a common prefix, that's ilm, and ilm again indicates the essential unity of life and the creator. For example, physics is more literally translated from Arabic as the science of nature, ilm tabiya, ilm tabiya, uh, arithmetics as the science of accounts, ilm al-hisab, ilm al-hisab. The religious study of Islam through Islamic sciences like Quranic exegesis, hadith studies is called al-ilm al-dini, science of religion, al-ilm al-diniya. Uh, using the same word for science as the science of nature, according to the Hanswell Dictionary of Arabic, while al-ilm is defined as knowledge, learning, load, and so the word for science is the plural forum that's alum, al, that's, uh, uh, alum in Arabic. The Quran is, is the source of uh, Islamic worldview. The question is that how the Quran presents Tawhidic wealth and shung, wealth and shung worldview before talking about knowledge and its categories. Yes, metaphysics and epistemology can be reconciled. The Quran says, Your Lord is God who created the heavens and earth in six days. Chapter 7, verse 54. The Quran states that Allah created the heavens and the earth and all this in between them in six days. Uh, chapter 7, verse 54. Again, we created the heavens and the earth and all that is between them in six days, nor did any sense of weariness touch us. Chapter 50, verse 6, 7, 38. The interpretation of the Arabic word ayam, one translation of which is days, as meaning long periods or ages rather than periods of 24 hours. So in this way, Quran has mentioned about the creation of the uh, universe in say, you know, uh, seven days, six days. Uh, similarly, in light of the Quranic theory of knowledge, the relationship between the concepts of general epistemology and those of Quranic epistemology rests on the question of relationship between akal and revelation way at epistemological level. And as we have already talked about that, so uh, this uh, revelation is purifying a human uh, reason from Gafla and Hawa. Right? It is uh, investing the reason with the zikr and huda. This is the source of true knowledge, according to many scholars, the goal of philosophy is understood by the ancient Gnostics to purify intellect. Islam has given it different uh, connotations. Moreover, the Quran has used the terms like akal, fikir, tafakku, tadabur, hukma, and ilm in the context of an integrated worldview where tawheed, risala, and akhra become the concern of every Islamic scientist and philosopher during his painstaking research and study of the universal phenomena. And he reaches to the theological paradigm during his journey to God. Therefore, Islamic epistemology can become a natural and impending alternative to modern materialistic 
and anarchical approach of the scientists and philosophers where absurdity reigns supreme. In the final analysis of Nobel laureates like Hawking and you know, renowned uh, 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 scientists like Penrose and postmodern stalwart philosophers, the Holy Quran invites spare humankind to study closely the heavens and the earth, the diversity of animals, the diversity of tongues, as I mentioned already. And in this way, it invites towards science and philosophical you know, connotations. The importance of Akal is further impl impl implied in the very task of rigidly comprehending the message of relation. So in this way, we can see that uh, uh, Quran has talked about uh, uh, the human reason. Quran has talked about uh, different categories of knowledge and Quran has talked about uh, such type of all uh, activities of human reason where a man can find a source for his philosophy and for his scientific uh, you know, developments. So this is the best way of understanding Islamic science in modern context and in the old context and the, uh, all the other contexts. Uh, and we can find that people like Imam Ghazali and uh, other scholars like Imam Razi and Ibn Rushd and uh, then uh, uh, Mullah Rumi and others, they have also talked in those terms and Imam Ghazali has said how we can oppose reason when Allah has placed the reason. And when Excuse reason, me, Professor. Yeah. Uh, we can see your PowerPoint, your uh, screenshot. We cannot see. You can't see. Okay, I have, I have just stopped you know, sharing oh, here because okay, I, have okay. completed, I have completed that. Now I'm okay. just trying to just uh, paraphrase it in my own way and just giving some more points. So basically I was saying that uh, Quran has given us a complete uh, uh, code of conduct for developing science and philosophy. It was because of this reason that after the revelation of the uh, Quran, that people started discussing matters like Qadr wa Qaza, Qaza wa Qadr, and also about other matters. And we find the schools like Mothazlites, Asharites, Marjoites, and Kharjites, and Shiites, and other groups, they emerged. And they were starting, they were talking, they were discussing, they were debating all these issues on the basis of the Quranic verses. And this was the starting point of the intellectual development and intellectual advancements among Muslims. That was Quran. Because Quran had just invited reason to think, ponder. And there are hundreds of verses in the Quran which always invite people towards aql, towards tafakkur, towards tadabbur, towards you know, hikmah, and towards ilm. And this was the first one. And that, that was the source also for the science which uh, Muslims just adopted and then they just took knowledge from all, si all sides. They got the books of the Greeks translated into Arabic and other communities al also. Their books were translated and those books were consisting of scientific knowledge, uh, medical knowledge, astronomical knowledge and all type of knowledge, algebraical knowledge, mathematical knowledge, arithmetic and other things. And that was under the influence of the Quranic you know, role and Quranic emphasis on reason and knowledge. And then we find that scholars of Islam, like Imam Ghazali and others, they have also given a detailed exposition about reason and revelation and the areas of reason and revelation. How reason is being supported by uh, revelation and how revelation is being supported by reason. So Quran is in this way a rational religion and it's a scientific religion and it has never believed in superstitions. And we find that Imam Ghazali says that if any person you know, opposes mathematics, he is opposing religion because Islam has nothing to do with the opposition of mathematics because it has been proved. And he says also that we don't have any problem with the philosophers so far as their physics is concerned or their mathematics is concerned or their logic is concerned. Rather logic is needed in order to understand you know, fiqh. So in his book, al Mustaspa Fi'usul uh, Fiqh, he says that their logic is very much important in order to develop their fiqh and just deal with the fiqh of Islam, that is jurisprudence. In the same way, he says that the example of reason is like eye, and example of sharia is like of sun. If a person does not possess eye, he can't have the vision of the sun. So such is the importance of reason in Islam. And he says that if reason is opposed, so what can be praised then? Because Allah has praised reason in Quran. So this is a very different approach to science and philosophy. In most cases, Muslims and others think that when the Greek philosophy was translated into Arabic, only Muslims started philosophizing 
or uh, dealing with science, but it's not true. Muslims had long before they had translated the books of the Greeks into Arabic, they had started scientific exploration and they had started philosophizing, talking, discussing, debating, and having a dialectical discussions among themselves. And they had developed Ilm al Qalam, that is the science of uh, you know, dialectics. And they were discussing all these problems. And this was the renaissance of rational and scientific revolution among the Muslims through the Quran and Hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu And Prophet Sallallahu also through his Hadith has been teaching Muslims uh, that they should learn knowledge. Uh, my, and it has been said that uh, on my youth, hikma faqad utiya khairan kasira. Whosoever has been endowed with the hikmah, he has been given the greatest good. And Prophet Sallallahu said that uh, uh, Allah gives the ifaqah of deen that a person has been endowed with a great uh, you know, good when he has been given uh, fiqh. And fiqh is a very great term in Quran, which shows that we should have a deeper understanding of human affairs. And Allah, uh, Prophet said, Allahumma faqih fi deen wa li It was said about Ibn Abbas. So, oh Allah, give him the knowledge of ta'weed and also teach him fiqh. So fiqh was also one of the sources of uh, knowledge and this was uh, later on developed into the tafakku and that became the Islamic law and fiqh. And we produced great scholars and great legal you know, authorities like Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam uh, you know, Shafi Rahmatullah, Imam Malik Rahmatullah, Imam you know, Ahmad Hanbal and so many others. That is based on these terms like fiqh and tafakku and fikr and hikmah. So in this way, all these terms which have been found in Quran, which have been promoted by Quran, show that Islam and Quran has always encouraged rationality. Quran has encouraged scientific exploration and Quran has given a philosophy of science to Muslims. They don't need to look to other philosophy of science as in modern times, some people want to become materialistic, atheistic when they want to develop science. No, Islam had given us philosophy of science and that is found in Quran and that is in the uh, Tawhidic belt and shown, and the Risala, Ibada, Khilafa, and Niyaba. And these are the terms which have been used also by Ismail Raji Faruqi in his book, that is Namaj of Knowledge, and uh, also by uh, Badu Zaman Nursi uh, in his Rasail Nur, that uh, there has been no dichotomy between reason and revelation in Islam. And there has been the threefold way of teaching in Islam. One was Zawiya, that is spiritual teaching. Second is Madrasa, that is religious teaching. And third is you know, Maktab, that is uh, worldly education. So we can come, Islam has combined and Quran has combined three types of knowledge, spiritual, religious, and scientific and worldly knowledge. So in this way, a complete scheme of uh, knowledge and epistemology has been provided by Quran. And this is different verses which I have mentioned, and I have given some details about that. And then I have also quoted Imam Ghazali at many places and other scholars of Islam in order to show that there has had been a always emphasis on rationality in Islam and taqlid has been denounced by these great scholars and uh, ijtihad has been upheld. And if Muslims will just go back to the Quran, they will again uh, regain their you know, lost glory in science, in, in uh, philosophy, in culture, in social sciences, in all fields of knowledge. If we want to excel, we have to go back to our Quran and our Hadith, our Sunnah. And that can give us a wherewithal and wealth and strong, which can make us to stand you know, firm on our own grounds and develop in science and philosophy and culture and education, and also face the world in modern times and also have technological and uh, scientific uh, developments and uh, achievements, and also compete the other countries, Sadiqu bil Khairat and Wa'idu Lahum Mastatamin Kuwa. And these are some of the verses which always in invite Muslims to prepare themselves for the better, you know, scientific, uh, uh, you know, equipment, and try to be ahead of others in all these matters in education, in philosophy, and in science, and in technology, and in technical education as well. So I think that you no, know, if I have some more time and if there are some questions and I am always mm. here to reply, I don't know how much time I have or I have completed. Uh, I think enough, sir. Uh, okay. We have time for discussion next. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. It was very nice to talk to you. 
Uh, Alhamdulillah, okay. I feel so happy whenever I talk to my uh, brothers of Indonesia and I, whenever I go there, because they are the yeah. people who are really knowledge loving people, and I always uh, you know get encouragement from them. Thank you. Okay, thank you very thank you very much, uh, Professor Hamidullah Marazi. Uh, brief uh, presentation. We we move to the next uh, speaker, uh, Professor Mun Insiri current research avenues in Quranic and Hadith studies. Uh, please, Professor Munaim. I'm sorry, I, uh, I forgot uh, to tell the speakers that uh, the time for uh, presentation is uh, uh, 30 minutes. Uh, 30 minutes? Yeah, 30 minutes, yeah, ah, maximal. Okay. Sure. Okay, no, no problem. So thank you, uh, Dr. Nobrizal, for uh, for uh, introducing me. Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Let me first express my deep gratitude to the organizers of this uh, conference for inviting me to this important event. Um, I'm really honored and humbled to share the virtual space with uh, distinguished speakers today. Uh, let me share my screen if I can. Um, so my presentation will reflect on the most recent development in the academic study of the Quran. Since our discussion seems to focus on the Quran, I will skip some uh, highlight on the Hadith. So, um, I will divide my presentation into uh, uh, basically uh, four major issues. I will first highlight some new development in Quranic studies and then talk about factors con that contribute to an increase in the scholarly study of the Quran. And then for the most part, I will discuss some new areas in the academic study of the Muslim scripture. And in, I have some time, I will talk a bit about Hadith, but perhaps I will not have enough time. I will conclude by offering a brief reflection on the future trajectories of the study of the Quran. So let me begin by highlighting some new development in Quranic studies. Although for the most part, I will talk about some recent uh, trends and uh, issues in the academic study of the Quran in, in, uh, among Western scholars, but even in the Muslim world, in the past few years, we witnessed some unprecedented development in the scholarly study of the Muslim scripture. From the 19th century, since Muhammad Abdu, for instance, and Rashid Rida, the study of the Quran seemed to take a new shape. And uh, as we know that in Egypt, we know some uh, scholars who uh, express their interest in the linguistic study of the Quran, including um, uh, uh, Amin, and developed further by uh, scholars like um, uh, uh, Hassan Hanafi or uh, um, Hamid Abu Zed. So my point is that this new development is not only happening in the Western Academy, academia. Even in the Muslim world, we witness unprecedented development in the scholarly study of the Quran. So one example of this development is the diversity of views that Quranic studies today has become so lively, so dynamic, and become a vibrant field of research. So, 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 so to describe this kind of development, one example of, of this phenomenon has been observed by David Stewart, who is a professor of Quranic studies at Emory University. So in his recent article, David Stewart argue that the field of Quranic studies is booming at present after remaining relatively quite corner of, his, of Arabic and Islamic studies for the middle decade of the 20th century. So Stewart here described the new development, the most recent development in the academic study of the Quran. So in the first half of the 20th century, the field of Quranic studies was quite um, um, uh, unimportant that most scholars are uh, talking about uh, Sufism, about um, uh, 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 legal issues, but for the most part, Quranic studies was, um, was neglected. It is only in the second part of the 20th century and at the beginning of the, 20th, of the 21st century that 
the, the field of chronic studies has become so vibrant to the extent that there is nothing that has been accepted at best value. Even the most basic thing about the Quran has become a subject of discussion among scholars. So to describe you know, the, the, this dynamic aspect of Quranic studies, Fred Donner argue that, as, as you can see from the screen, that Quranic studies as a field of academic research appear today to be in a state of disarray in the sense that there is almost no consensus among scholars concerning the Quran. Even the most basic question concerning, you know, you know, when and under what circumstances the Quran was revealed, in what language were, that the Quran first emerged, and who was the, out, the first audience of the Quran. These basic questions have been the subject of much discussion among Western scholars. So Donner argue, uh, Donner is a professor of um, uh, 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 Islamic origin at the University of Chicago. He basically argue that there is nothing that scholars agree on the Quran. Even about the, what language that the Quran first emerged has been the subject of discussion that I will highlight in a moment. So to, this, to, 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 you know, to further describe this recent phenomenon, my colleague here at the University of Notre Dame, uh, uh, you know, I argue that perhaps the golden age of Quranic studies has arrived. So Gabriel Reynolds uh, observed you know, some most recent activities among scholars when researching the Quran, including uh, some most recent attempt to produce the, um, uh, the, the critical edition of the Quran. As you may know that since the second half of the, uh, first of the 19th century, some scholars attempt to produce you know, critical edition of the Quran. So the Quran that we have, the standard edition of the Quran, was not uh, uh, you know, a critical edition. Um, as, as we know, we, as we all know that the, the existing Quran, the standard edition of the Quran, can only be traced back to 1924, when a group of scholars in Egypt was commissioned by the Minister of Endowment to produce you know, what became the standard edition of the Quran. And the, commis the, the, the committee, a group of scholars commissioned by the Minister of Endowment, based their, uh, 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 you know, their, 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 their Quran on one type of reading, which, which was the, the reading of Hafiz and Asim. So it was not a critical edition in the sense that there was no a critical apparatus uh, involved in the production of the Quran. So some Western scholars in the past, you know, uh, a few decades have, have attempted to produce this kind of critical edition of the Quran. So Gabriel Reynolds noticed this activity and, and therefore he argued that indeed if such things were to be evaluated by the level of activity alone then it would seem that the golden age of Quranic studies has arrived. So this is just to uh, show us how dynamic, how vibrant and lively the academic study of the Quran, particularly in the Western world today. Now, what are the factors that contribute to an increase in the scholarly interest in the scholarly study of the Quran? So of course, you know, the, 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 the most recent development, as I mentioned and, and presented, did not, um, you know, emerge only in the 21st century or in the 20th century. Even from the 18th, um, even earlier, the Quran has become one of the most, um, you know, studied uh, texts, perhaps. So the first translation of the Quran into a Western language was done in the 12th century. So Robert of Caton perhaps was the first Western scholar who translated the Quran into Latin. So uh, the work of um, Robert of Caton and, and, and many scholars from the 12th century to the 16th century was studied by Thomas uh, Berman, who wrote a very interesting book entitled Reading the Quran in Latin Christendom in which Thomas Berman, who is my colleague here at Notre Dame, examined uh, you know, the earliest translation of the Quran into Latin language. Of course, you know, in, the, uh, in the Middle uh, Ages, in the 12th and 16th century, the Quran was translated 
or some Western scholars attempt to understand the Quran for polemical purpose. But since the 19th century, there was a shift uh, in the Western study of the Quran from polemic to more kind of scholarly. So if we examine the work of Abraham Giga from Germany, for instance, we understand that you know Abraham Giga seem to uh, you know to understand the Quran from more scholarly perspective rather than uh, uh, polemical. Uh, the work of you know another German scholar uh, Theodor Nordeka perhaps represent another uh, scholarly attempt to understand the history of the Quran, the, the Muslim scripture. Perhaps since you know the 1970s, uh, there has uh, uh, another. Uh, development emerged in the Western scholarly study of the Quran, what we may call as revisionist, revisionist scholarship, in which some scholars like a British scholar John Wansbrew or, 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 or John Barton uh, or American scholar Patricia Crona, they approach the Quran from more a critical a perspective. So Wansbrough, for instance, argue that perhaps the stabilization of the Quranic text or the canonization of the Quran may have been uh, uh, taken place much much later than it is presented in the uh, in the Muslim sources. Uh, John Barton, in contrast to uh, John Wansbrough's arg argument, argue perhaps the Quran has been codified into a single book even during the time of the prophets. So here you see that even among sco among uh, scholars that that we can identify as a revisionist, there are differences of opinions. So this diversity of opinions, the diversity of perspective, really mark the beginning of the scholarly study of the Muslim scripture. So um, I will highlight some uh, 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 major uh, development uh, uh, areas of new research that have been uh, uh, taken place in the past uh, few years. The first major uh, um, uh, area of research that have been uh, done and many uh, uh, you know uh, scholarly work have been conducted on on the Muslim scripture is concerning the history of the Quranic text, how the Quran has become what we know today. So perhaps this history of the Quranic text is one of the most controversial issues because it seems to contradict the traditional account about the codification of the Muslim scripture. We know so well that according to the, the, the traditional account that the Quran has been put together into a single book, it's called Mus'haf, during the time of the, the first caliph, Abu Bakr, and become canon or become uh, tactus receptus during the time of the third caliph, Usman bin Affan. However, some Western scholars call these traditional account into question because we don't have evidence to support the the idea that the Quran has become a stable text from quite early. So uh, some scholars uh, uh, you know uh, uh, put forth different arguments concerning the the you know the, the the time when the Quran has become what we know today. Another aspect of the history of the Quranic text is concerning and what circumstance that, that the Quran was produced or the Quran was revealed to the Prophet Muhammad? We know that according to the, the, the traditional account that the Quran was revealed to the Prophet Muhammad uh, in, in Mecca and Medina, which were often described as a paganistic in nature, in the sense that there were not significant number of Christians or Jews in Mecca. Of course, the Islamic tradition uh, mentioned about the existence of uh, a number of uh, Jewish tribe in Medina, but there was no significant number of uh, Christians in, uh, in, 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 in Mecca in particular. And therefore, according to the Islamic tradition, that the Quran emerged or was revealed to the Prophet within a pagan environment. However, some scholars uh, call this uh, 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 account into question because if we look at the text of the Quran itself, it seems that the audience of the Quran is not as pagan as it is presented in the Islamic tradition. The Quran seems to engage with biblical literature in the sense that, uh, that the audience of the Quran must have been familiar with the Bible and para-biblical literature. 
and therefore if you look at the text of the Quran itself it gives us a different picture so this is another area of research that have been uh, 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 much discussed by uh, most recent scholars another aspect of research uh, uh, falling under this category of the history of the Quranic text is concerning the question of reduction how the Quran has become what we know it today does it undergo certain a process of reduction or certain process of editing can we identify that the Quran was produced by a single author or other multiple authors of the Quran in the sense that the Quran underwent certain editing process and therefore cannot be uh, a trustback to a single editor so this this question has been uh, much discussed in the past few years uh, concerning uh, you know the process of re you know uh, re reduction of the quran to become what we know today uh, another uh, you know aspect that also fall under this uh, this area of research is the question whether the quran can be uh, uh, taken as a historical source for the emergence of, of, of Islam. Uh, you know, if, if we uh, study, uh, you know, how Islam emerged into history, can we use the Quran as historical source? Uh, we know that there is no uh, contemporary source uh, 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 concerning the emergence of Islam. The Islamic tradition has been written much much later after the death of the Prophet. And the Quran is perhaps the only textual evidence that is contemporary to the life of the prophets. So the, qu the question that some scholars, you know, oppose or ask themselves is whether the Quran can be taken as a historical source if we examine the origin of the Muslim uh, of, of Islam. Uh, the second area of uh, of research concerning the Quran is about the literary features of, of, of Arabic. Um, we know that the Quran uh, as we have today is an Arabic, but the question is uh, what kind of literary features did the Quran use to convey the message? Uh, can we assume that the Quran was, um, um, uh, you know, that the Quran did emerge first in, in, in Arabic, or is it possible that the Quran was kind of uh, 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 text that was, uh, you know, uh, undergoing certain type of Arabization or Islamization. So we know that um, uh, Christoph Luxembourg, as, as, as you can see from the screen, wrote a very interesting book. It's called Zero Aramic Reading of the Quran, in which he argued basically that the Quran was first uh, you know, that the Quran first emerged not as Arabic, but rather in Syriac. It was only later that the Quran underwent certain type of Arabization. So for, Christ, for, for Christoph Luxembourg, that the Quran is bilingual in nature, in the, in the sense that it includes, if we trace the language, the, the Arabic language in the Quran, we will see that underlying the Arabic language, there is a Syriac idea. Uh, of course, you know, this kind of argument uh, is not acceptable to Muslim. But if you look at the text of the Quran, uh, 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 Christoph Luxembourg offers some examples that urge us to rethink about the, you know, the, the, the language uh, that the Quran, uh, you know, uh, uh, first emerged. Um, I, I may uh, I go quickly because I don't think that I have much time here. And the third a major area of research um, among scholars today is concerning the relationship between the Quran and the Bible. In the history of the Islamic religion, the question of falsification has been one of the most contested issues that, that, that the Bible is falsified, that there is no an authentic text of the Bible. Although, uh, you know, scholars are divided uh, uh, concerning this issue whether the falsification takes place in 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 the text or rather it is misinterpretation of the bible but the question of falsification has been one of the most um uh, perhaps unchanged view among muslim even today uh, a british scholar uh, kate zabiri wrote very interesting book entitled 
uh, a Muslim and Christian face to face in which he argued that Muslim scholars even today uh, ascribe to the view that the Bible has been falsified, that there is no an authentic text of the Bible. However, most recent scholars address the issue in different ways. Instead of talking about the question of falsification, some scholars ask the question whether the Quran is in fact in dialogue with the Bible. Because if you look at the text of the Quran, you will find from page to nada biblical references in the Quran either in the form of narrative, legal issues, uh, you know, biblical figures, um, which seem to suggest that the Quran um, refer to some biblical literature, which also mean that the audience of the Quran was familiar with the biblical text. So this is another, uh, you know, important um, aspect of, you know, the area of research that has been much, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, conducted by uh, uh, recent scholars. Can we say that the Quran is a let antique text? Can we understand the Quran in a broader context rather than just in the context of the Hijaz or Mecca and Medina, or whether Mecca and Medina or the Hijaz was not as isolated as many people tend to think? Can we read the Quran as a late antique text? So this is another, uh, you know, uh, area of research which seems to suggest that if if we agree with the view that the Quran seems to engage in conversation with the Bible, can then we say that the Quran and the Bible both emerge from within the same cultural environment? So this is another important topic that that we can explore. Uh, that that you know you know much work has been uh, done on 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 this issue. The last um, uh, area of research before I uh, offer my own uh, reflection is concerning the study of the Quranic old manuscripts. This is an uh, uh, an emerging subfield of Quranic studies that has uh, you know attract a scholarly attention in the past few years. Um, one um, uh, 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 research uh, that has been done on the subject is concerning the, man the Sana manuscript. Uh, in, as, as you may know that in 1972, um, there was a um, uh, discovery of old manuscript in the mosque of Sana uh, in Yemen, in which the Grand Mosque of Sana was, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, the, the roof of the of 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 of, of the mosque um, uh, uh, fell down because of the flood, and there was discovered, uh, you know, numerous manuscript, including the, the perhaps one of the oldest manuscript uh, that we have today. This manuscript has been studied by a number of scholars, including uh, this French scholar Asma Hilali, who studied the manuscript carefully. Uh, many other scholars studied the manuscript, including uh, 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 Bahnam Siddiqui, who argue that perhaps the, the, you know, the manuscript has been written twice. So the lower level of the manuscript must have been uh, non-Osmanic uh, uh, text, uh, but then it was uh, erased and then rewritten another uh, text which seemed to conform with the Osmanic text. So this this perhaps one of the oldest manuscripts has been uh, studied by, uh, by, by many scholars who basically argue, uh, you know, uh, that perhaps the stabilization of the Quranic text, uh, you know, uh, must have been taken place much earlier than it is uh, presumed by a uh, revisionist, radical revisionist scholar like John Wansbro. So Asma Hilali and many other scholars, including Bahnab Siddiqui, argue that, 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 that this Sanat manuscript must have been uh, one of the earliest. So the way to, um, you know, trace the the age of the Quranic manuscript can uh, can take uh, uh, at least uh, three three th th three forms. One if one one is uh, using what what uh, some scholars call uh, call as paleography, meaning that you examine the shape of the Arabic scripts, and the second one is orthography of the of the Quranic scripts. Um, 
you know, it, whether the script is written in Hijazi or in Kufi, uh, for, or, or whether, you know, the text includes some ornament, that kind of uh, features, you know, can tell us about, uh, you know, the, the age of the manuscript. Another way of dating the Quranic manuscript is using radiocarbon dating, which is more uh, te technology in nature. So my point here is to show, you know, how much work has been done on this very issue, uh, you know, to examine the, you know, the, 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 the material evidence concerning uh, the Muslim scripture. So let me conclude by um, offering my uh, reflection uh, uh, concerning what has happened with the academic study of the Quran. So without question, in the past few decades, at least two decades, we witnessed unprecedented development in the academic study of the Quran. This, this not only evident from the number of publication and also the different conferences have been convened, but also the establishment of a learned society, like uh, what we have today, the association of you know, Quranic and Hadith studies, which reflect um, uh, 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 another important step toward the scholarly study of the Quran. By any measure, in the past few years, we witnessed the dynamic and, and vibrant study of the Quran, which reflect how important it is to study the Muslim scripture. So the question that scholars often ask themselves, whether Muslims as believers can be critical in their study of the Quran. If, if we know that, that the Quranic study in the West, the field of Quranic studies in the West seem to uh, reach uh, a level of what uh, you know, Gabriel Renal called as the, gold, the golden age. What about the state of Quranic studies in our Islamic universities? If Quranic studies in the West has become so vibrant, so lively, what about the field of Quranic studies in Indonesia, for instance? You know, why, uh, you know, Western scholars approach the Quran in such a way that the field of Quranic studies has become so, uh, so vibrant. So some scholars often argue that, that the reason for this uh, new development in the West, because Western scholars approach the Quran as a literary text, because they do not believe in the divine origin of the Muslim scripture, and therefore they feel, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, freedom to approach the text in the way they, they, they like. So, so um, uh, Muslims in Indonesia, for instance, they cannot approach the Quran in the way they, they want because, you know, uh, faith seem to be um, uh, obstacles in their critical study of, 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 of their scripture. However, this assumption might no longer, uh, 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 you know, be defensible because even today there are Muslims in the West who approach the Quran with critical eyes. So Asma Hilali, Bahnam Siddiqui, just to mention, just to mention a few scholars, Muslim scholars who examine the Quran from critical point of view. So I, the idea that, you know, uh, that Muslim cannot approach the Quran with critical view because of their, because of our faith can no longer be, uh, be, be defended. And therefore, if we ask the question whether believers, whether Muslim can be critical, uh, you know, in our study of the Quran, the, I, the, uh, the answer is not that they can, but rather they must be critical in their study of their scripture. As Professor Hamidullah just mentioned earlier, that the Quran itself encourages us to use our intellects in our tadabbur of the Quran. So there is no reason that Muslims cannot be critical in our study of our own scripture. And therefore, uh, the idea that the Quran must be treated differently from any other scriptures can no longer, uh, you know, uh, 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 taken as, as, as an approach. So the Quran should not be taken as an exception and therefore it cannot be approached 
from critical perspective. By any mean, any scholarship is humane in scholarship in the sense that it is human understanding of the text. And therefore, what we can do is to be humble in our study of, 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 the, of our own scripture. And, 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 you know, there is a lot of things that we need to do in order to enhance our scholarly study of the Quran. I'm really delightful to see that this, or this um, association, you know, the association of, you know, for the study of, 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 of the Quran and Hadith, uh, you know, ha, you know, in the, in the past few years conduct, uh, have conducted a numerous uh, conferences in order, uh, you know, to help the academic study of the Quran in Indonesia in particular to reach a level that can be seen as critical. So I think I can I can conclude here with positive note, and then I turn over to uh, to Mr. Uh, moderator to Mr. Uh, to Dr. Nofrizal. Thank you, and I'm I'm looking forward to our discussion. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Munaim, uh, a brief explanation and uh, give us inspiration to to the next reset in area study of uh, the Al-Quran. Uh, we invite uh, the, the third speaker, uh, Ibu Lili Umi Kalsum, will talk about uh, Tahfiz Al-Quran trends in Indonesia. Silahkan Ibu Lili. Ibu Lili bisa sudah bisa bisa mendengar suara saya. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Oke, okay. waalaikumsalam. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Maaf Ibu Lili, suaranya kurang kurang jelas belum sarapan ini iya Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Waalaikumsalam Alhamdulillahirrahmanirrahim Alhamdulillahirrahmanirrahim Nazal Quran wa hifzih Wassalatu wassalamu ala rasulih Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alih Abba Ba'ad Al Mutaram Al Aziz Amit Kuliah Usuluddin Dr. Bapak Dr. Yusuf Rahman MA Al Mukarram Al Aziz Amit Kuliah Usul uh, Dakwah Dakwatul Islam wa Ilmu Komunikasi <laughs> Profesor Dr. Suparto uh, Al Mutaram Al Aziz Naib Amit Kuliah Usuluddin, Profesor Dr. Kusman MA, wa Dr. Edwin Syarif, wa Jamil al Musharikin, al Muhtarimin, al Hadirin, fil Muktamar al Dauli, sebab min khilali rufa al istimaat zoom, abil Hadirin, fi hada al makan, fi hada al fi hada al fursah, saukadimukum hada al makalah ala al Adwan. Tren Tahfidul Quran di Indonesia. Uh, saya share screen dulu. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim uh, Al-Ittijah Fi Tahfid Al-Quran Fi Indonesia Al-Mustama' Al-Isri Al-Dini Yata'arud Al-Mustama' Al-Isri Lil'awlamah Al-Dini Hasrat Hadil Halah 
Awlama Jamahriya al Taqwa wa Tashriya Adin al Rohani. La yum ki no fasla din al Shabi an Tashwiq al Salak. Itu ada bahasa Indonesia. Gordon Melton Said Ekola. Anahdoh lil mustama al Asri tadu Omazid dan bila tarkiz alat tam ala namtil hayah al-jadid wala mawjadil hajah ar-ruhaniyah wa hadha min ta'thiri teknologi al-muntakuti fa min huna intasharat ashkal minan nasyad ar-ruhi awin nasyad ad-dini ya saya campur-campur aja bahasanya eee Mada al-Zahir itu hibur Al-Quran di Indonesia. Di Al-Quran al-Hadi wal-Ashrin, wasalat al-Muasas al-Taalimiyah al-Qaimah ala bernamis tafid Al-Quran ila ad Shabiyah mencapai popularitasnya pada abad ke-21. Ini saya tambahkan. Jadi kalau tahun 1900-an itu jika ada orang menghafal Al-Quran itu sesuatu yang sangat-sangat jarang sehingga ketika ada siswa sekelas SD sampai SMP SMA itu hampir jarang yang hafal Quran setelah itu baru dia mesantren khusus tafid ya tetapi pada abad 20 sudah mulai tergerak dan abad 21 Uh, itu mulai mencapai popularitasnya sehingga dikatakan oleh uh, Turner tadi bahwasanya apakah ini dampak dari uh, modernitas uh, kemajuan mod modern yang kemudian arahnya adalah komodifikasi atau komersialisasi dari kegiatan-kegiatan uh, keagamaan Al-Zahiru al-Ula, ini saya beberapa memberikan beberapa fenomena yang bisa kita lihat, baik di ya beberapa berita atau di medsos ya, banyak sekali. Tahawalul baitul ilal makan rukhos li tahfid al-Quran, awbunia makan rukhos li tahfid. Yang asalnya rumah biasa menjadi rumah tahfid, atau kemudian yang asalnya pengusaha, kemudian tiba-tiba beliau ingin membangun rumah tahfid, Meskipun beliau tidak hafal Quran, meskipun beliau belum punya guru Quran, yang penting ada proposalnya dulu untuk membangun. <laughs> Inilah fenomena fenomena yang biasa yang yang sampai detik ini kita nikmati, kita lihat di beberapa medsos ya. Kemenak ya ini. sama ni miah wa sama ni wa sabain, itu tahfid ya yang terdaftar resmi di jadi kemenak itu bagian pendidikan Al Quran kami pernah ini meeting ya dengan orang kemenak merasakan keresahan dengan menjamurnya rumah-rumah tahfid baik itu rumah tahfid yang gratis maupun rumah taf gratis dalam tanda kutip ya santrinya gratis tapi dia kan banyak donaturnya atau dia pasang-pasang uh, kotak-kotak amal di mana-mana <laughs> sehingga semuanya menyerukan tentang agama uh, ag ya semoga nggak masuk di acit acit itu ya <laughs> uh, kemudian banyak rumah-rumah tafid yang uh, ya banyak sekali rumah tafid yang sebenarnya itu tidak memiliki guru atau SDM-nya kurang. Kalau kita memiliki lembaga pendidikan, pastinya harus ada SDM-nya terlebih dahulu, ya. SDM-nya terlebih dahulu dipasang, kemudian adalah itu bangunan, baru kita mengundang santri. Banyak fenomena yang kita lihat dan kita saya meneliti sejak 2018 ya sampai sekarang juga terus berlangsung beberapa mewawancarai adalah 
dengan berbagai motivasi positif maupun negatif. Kemenak merasa resah tersebut akhirnya eh, eh, bagian kasubdit ya pendidikan Al-Quran membuat aplikasi namanya Sibdar, Sistem Informasi Pelayanan Tanda Daftar. Jadi semua yang ber, mempunyai lembaga yang berbau pendidikan Al-Quran harus mendaftar. Dan ini khusus pada lebih khususkan lagi pada rumah rumah tafid. Pada rumah tafid sehingga eh, menjamurnya secara kuantitas bisa dipertanggungjawabkan secara kualitas. Nah, ini. Eh, Al-Zuhiru Al-Thaniyah, pesantren yang fokus ya, Al-Mu'ahad Al-Maksus di Tafid Al-Quran, tiba-tiba eh, tahawul ya, berubah menjadi eh, Al-Mu'ahad Al-Islami khosoh di Tafid Al-Quran. Sehingga terjadi <tuh> paksaan itu, dalam tanda kutip ya, jadi santri, dalam sebuah pesantren itu ada yang santrinya sekolah formal kemudian mengaji kitab ya eh, literatur keislaman harus menghafalkan alfiah balagho dan lain sebagainya tetapi juga karena tahfid menjadi tren kalau pesantren eh, Idalam yakun tafidul Quran ihuna lam yakun uh, ya tulab ya apabila tidak dimasukkan uh, materi tafidul Quran maka sulit mencari santri ini yang terus menggema sehingga uh, beberapa penas uh, beberapa pengasuh Al Quran pengasuh pesantren kecuali yang pesantren sudah memiliki nama besar ya. Tapi pesantren yang baru-baru lahir 5-10 tahun harus berubah baju dan harus menyisipkan dalam kurikulumnya tafidil Quran. Termasuk juga uh, Al-Zuhir Al-Salisah ini Al-Mu'assasah Resmiah. Ya. Mimar halati raudatil atfal, mulai dari paut ya. Ilam rahalatil jami'i, sampai pada kampus tazidu ta'limi dirosi fi fanni tafidil Quran. Kaifa maka nala buddha ala tolib ayyalakho ma hafidhoh. Tadi itu. Jadi santri atau mahasiswa harus mempelajari semuanya. Siap, di sini saya tulis, siap atau tidak siap, ya mampu atau tidak mampu, semua siswa dan mahasiswa diharuskan mau menyetorkan hafalan Al-Quran. Ini tidak luput juga terjadi di UIN Syarif Widodo Jakarta Fakultas Sosioludin luar biasa. Kalau itu bisa menjadi luar biasa. Azhirah <tuh> Arabiah Hawalai Salis wa Ishrin ya Jamiah Tuati Min Haadirosa Adirosia Lihufadil Quran. Jadi lebih dari 23 ini dilaporkan di websitenya itu ada ada beasiswa tahfid ya saking merebaknya tahfid itu sampai diambil diambil juga e, isu tren ini oleh lembaga-lembaga pendidikan sehingga e, harus memberikan ruang khusus harus memberikan ruang khusus tafidul Quran diberi diberi beasiswa e, dari 23 itu saya menulis hanya beberapa e, pertama ini Kampus kita, Jamiatina, UIN Syarif Dawa Jakarta, memberikan beasiswa baik pada calon mahasiswa baru ataupun mahasiswa ongoing yang sudah berjalan adalah uh, mulai dari uh, ini 20 30 juz ya. Di dalam website itu tidak disebutkan nominal. Tapi biasanya yang diberikan adalah penghargaan dari setiap tahun semua mahasiswa berprestasi, termasuk juga prestasi uh, tafidul Quran. Pada awal-awal pembukaan fakultas kedokteran itu juga termasuk memberikan beasiswa bagi uh, santri khususnya yang fokus tafidul Quran. Uh, 
uh, bisa kuliah di kedokteran secara gratis. UN Yogyakarta memberikan uang kuliah gratis dan uang saku plus uang saku bagi yang bisa hafal uh, Ishrin Wasalasi Najusan. Nah, insya Allah. <tuh> UNS Surakarta 20 juz uang kuliah gratis. Nah, di sini IPB ya Falasi Najusan disetarakan dengan Olimpiade Internasional. Ya, jadi maksudnya eh, bila ada siswa yang mengikuti lomba Olimpiade Internasional mendapatkan eh, reward ya, mendapatkan eh, apa namanya hadiah atau kenang-kenangan sekian, maka orang yang 30 juz pun harus disetarakan hadiahnya seperti itu. Ketika eh, 15 sampai 29 juz setara dengan Olimpiade Nasional. Unisba 30 juz ya. E, biaya kuliah gratis sampai lulus. Alauddin Makassar ini dipakai grid ya. E, sampai Asyar itu gratis 2 semester, Isyrin gratis 4 semester, Falasina Jusan gratis sampai lulus. Ya, semua e, ya seperti iklan gitu ya. Unmer Malang tidak disebutkan tetapi diberikan kepada tidak disebutkan nominalnya. Unmer Malang bukan hanya e, mahasiswa tetapi diberikan kepada e, mahasiswa, dosen dan karyawan. UIN Malang memberikan juga e, kuliah gratis minimal 10 juz. E, inilah fenomena yang e, kita lihat selama ini ya, sehingga beberapa pesantren atau beberapa lembaga-lembaga dipaksa oleh wali-wali murid supaya bisa mengejar beasiswa ini, mengharuskan anak didiknya, mengharuskan anak kandungnya agar hafal Al-Quran supaya meringankan beban orang tua bisa menyekolahkan di beberapa perguruan tinggi yang terkenal tersebut. Jadi ada pergeseran-pergeseran niat dalam tafidil Quran. So, eh, kemudian apa kata mereka? So, keliru. Mada wa aroihim ya, ala hadhil, ala hadhil dzuahiroh. Ada beberapa, ya kita wawancarai sebagian ya, beberapa orang tua dan lain sebagainya. Ada plus minusnya. Yang positif mengatakan hadhi syiar Islam, ya untuk me Ya, untuk me, me, meningkatkan lah, meningkatkan syiar Islam dengan semarak tafid. Jadi eh, menyebarluaskan tatawur syiar Islam bi tafid. Sanian litakor rubil mujtama eh, ila ila Quran wa ma'ani. Kemudian ada juga yang mengatakan eh, apa ya? Untuk meningkatkan eh, keahlian meningkatkan keahlian atau di dalam dunia tafid itu bisa dibayangkan menghafal 6.200-an sehingga eh, dia memiliki kebiasaan rutin memiliki eh, otaknya sudah biasa diasah dalam satu hari harus hafal sekian ayat dalam satu hari harus bisa menjaga hafalannya sekian juz sehingga kebiasaan untuk bisa meminit waktu kebiasaan untuk mengasah otaknya itu bisa tercermin di dalam mereka yang menghafal Al-Quran. Idealnya seperti itu. Nomor empat adalah bisa membangun ya karakter ya karakter anak ini positif, komentar yang positif melalui dia mendekati Al-Quran berkali-kali sehingga eh, tercerminlah cahaya Al-Quran kemudian ya barokahnya dan lain sebagainya sehingga menjadi ahlakul karimah peningkatan ahlak dari daripada daripada yang tidak mengaji ini komentar yang positif
Sehingga eh, menurut mereka sosok seperti itu, siswa yang seperti itu yang mau menyisihkan waktunya untuk menghafal Al-Quran layaklah diberi penghargaan. Bagaimana yang negatif? Eh, ini, ini perwakilan aja ya, sebenarnya banyak sekali pendapat dan hasil dari wawancara mengatakan bahwasanya eh, di sini memaksa ada ada pemaksaan ya eh, memaksakan sesuatu yang sebenarnya tidak diwajibkan artinya eh, se -se sebenarnya Hafid tidak wajib tetapi harus dipaksakan mulai TK sampai mahasiswa. Kemudian karantina tafid ada ada ya digunakan untuk ini tanda kutip ya tidak seluruhnya. Ini namanya juga komentar. Tidak seluruhnya, pastinya juga banyak yang bagus. Tapi ada beberapa yang menggunakannya untuk komersialisasi agama. Contoh contohnya eh, Ya, karena banyak sekali ya yang mengeluh di atau yang mengeluh lah istilahnya ya karena eh, diminta sekian juta diminta sekian juta gitu ya jadi ada sebuah pendidikan tafid contohnya contoh dua bulan bisa hafal tapi bayar lima juta gitu nah kalau orientasinya supaya dapat beasiswa, sedangkan pendaftaran Maret itu sudah harus daftar, maka bisa dibayangkan orang tua itu menggebu-gebu untuk bisa daftar itu 5 juta untuk anaknya supaya tafid, ya, supaya bisa masuk UNER, bisa UGM, dan lain sebagainya menawarkan beasiswa tadi, masuklah di situ. Setelah saya saya, saya lihat, ya ternyata apa? Karena eh, saya juga pelaku, pelaku dari penghafal itu ya, jadi kayaknya tidak mungkin ya, menghafalkan 6.000 itu hanya dua bulan gitu ya, kecuali memang eh, 1.001 mungkin. Sehingga saya kita lihat lulusannya, gimana lulusan dari dua bulan itu, benarkah dia eh, hafidul Quran tamaman, salah sina juzan gitu ya? Ternyata no, nothing gitu ya. Ternyata tidak ada gitu. Terus saya tanya, ibu anaknya hafal berapa? Iya, karena ini masih eh, anak saya sudah bagus sih, sudah bisa hafal 10 dengan 5 juta itu. Terus iya harus kita harus mau ikut lagi angkatan berikutnya. Jadi bayar 5 juta lagi untuk angkatan berikutnya. Nah, saya datangi anaknya, coba baca juz sekian. Ternyata nggak bisa. Baca juz sekian, ternyata nggak bisa. <laughs> ya, ini mungkin ini kasuistik ya, mungkin kasuistik yang tetapi eh, dari fenomena yang kita wawancarai pastinya saya tidak menyudutkan yang positif pasti banyak juga sekali lagi saya hanya melihat ada sisi positif dan negatifnya dan eh, di sini yang komentar ketiga ini banyak sekali ini dari di Usuludin juga banyak mahasiswa berbeda-beda potensi sehingga Bila tafidul Quran itu dipaksakan dalam sebuah kurikulum, maka akan memperhambat percepatan studi. Yang keempat, pemberian beasiswa tafid seharusnya selektif, sehingga tidak diberikan kepada mantan hafid. Artinya, benar-benar ya kita punya alumni yang hafid ya, alhamdulillah bisa masuk di universitas negeri di Indonesia ini. Dan itu universitas tersebut memang benar-benar memberikan tes sampai 20 soal. Nah, itu ketika lulus, baru dia lulus, eh, diberi beasiswa kedokteran full sampai lulus. Nah, ini, ini artinya eh, uang tersebut tidak sia-sia gitu ya. Sehingga bagi mereka yang eh, negatif eh, komentar ini, mengatakan daripada diberikan hafid yang sudah mantan, mendingan diberikan oleh ma kepada mahasiswa yang kreatif dalam menulis, mahasiswa yang punya eh, keahlian di bidang lain yang juga mendukung eh, profesionalisme eh, seorang siswa yang bisa menjadi dosen dan lain sebagainya. Oke, eh, berikutnya adalah apa sebenarnya ma makna tafidil Quran al hakiki ya hafidoh itu menjaga tafid artinya penjagaan sehingga 
tafidul Quran di oh, tafidul Quran dimaknai sebagai uh, penjagaan seseorang terhadap ayat-ayat Al Quran ya dijaga dari uh, adanya pengurangan ataupun penambahan intinya adalah uh, tagir ya tagir ayat Al Quran uh, dijaga uh, al hafad minat tagir ayat Al Quran. Nah pertanyaan berikutnya hal minal wajib lil muslim ayat Al Quran ya apakah memang diharuskan Apakah memang diharuskan semua muslim muslimah itu untuk menghafal Al-Qur'an sehingga eh, dengan fenomena sebesar tadi ya berbagai proposal datang di meja-meja eh, <guruh> untuk bisa membangun rumah tafid dan lain sebagainya sehingga Beberapa wali murid, wali uh, santri dan lain sebagainya memaksakan anaknya untuk bisa uh, tahfiz Al-Quran. Hasil penelusuran ayat Al-Quran tidak ditemukan, ya tidak ditemukan ayat Al-Quran yang memerintahkan, memerintahkan kepada setiap Muslim untuk hafal taman, ya salasi najusan min Al-Quran. Tidak ada uh, ditemukannya itu uh, di dalam hadis. Kalau hadis ada yang memuji banyak ya memberikan syafaat dan sebagainya juga termasuk ancaman bagi hafid Quran yang tidak bisa menjaganya itu banyak e, disebutkan di hadis. Tetapi yang memerintahkan Al Quran murah hadis yang memerintahkan wahai kaum Muslim hendaklah e, hafalah semua ayat Al Quran 30 juz itu tidak ada sehingga ini ada yang kurang ya. Uh, haf, menghafal Al-Quran itu dihukumi fardu kifayah, ya fardu kifayah sehingga apabila sudah terwakili, ya apabila sudah terwakili maka tidak perlu untuk semuanya digerakkan bila itu memang tidak atau kurang memenuhi persyaratannya. Yang diwajibkan di dalam ayat Al-Quran dihafalkan hanyalah surah Fatihah. Karena ini bagian karena al-fatihah itu ruknun min arkanis solah. Karena rukun solah koli di samping atahya adalah al-fatihah. Ini yang ini yang harus diwajibkan sehingga pesantren-pesantren ulama-ulama dahulu ketika menyetorkan bacaan fatihah itu bisa sampai satu bulan, dua bulan, tiga bulan. Eh, supaya benar makhrotnya ketika makhrojul huruf sifatul huruf dalam uh, al-fatihah benar itu bisa membawa atau bisa uh, membaca berikutnya ayat-ayat Al-Qur'an yang lain. Nah, pertanyaan berikutnya adalah uh, ya, siapa penjaga hakiki teks Al-Qur'an? Ini pastinya jawabannya adalah uh, kreatornya ya pemiliknya inna nahnu nazzalna dzikra wa inna lahu lahafizun para mufasir menjelaskan bahwasanya ayat ini merupakan penegasan atas sangkaan beberapa orang yang tidak beriman pada waktu itu eh bahwasanya Al-Qur'an adalah kreasi Muhammad yang dijuluki sebagai ahli syair ayat ini sekaligus menjawab bahwasanya teks Al-Qur'an ya adalah produk Allah Subhanahu wa taala bukanlah kreasi Nabi Muhammad yang dibilang bekerja sama dengan malaikat Jibril ya. Dan dalam ayat ini Allah secara eh, eksplisit menyebutkan nahnu nazzalna dzikra wa inna lahu lahafizun beliaulah yang akan men menjaga kalamnya sendiri ya menciptakan dan sekaligus menjaga kalamnya. Nah, pertanyaan berikutnya adalah nih, bila Tuhan pemilik Quran kuasa menjaga Al Quran. Ini pertanyaan-pertanyaan saya tulis ada yang pertanyaan yang sering dulu dilontarkan ke saya. Bila, ya. Sering ini ketika kita meng, me, mengajar tafid ya ada saja yang bertanya e, macam-macam gitu ya. 
bila Al-Quran itu, bila Allah itu pemilik Quran sekaligus menjaga, mengapa seorang Muslim bersusah payah untuk menghafalnya? Nah, untuk menjawab pertanyaan ini, sebagian ini saya tulis di sini, uh, jadi Ba'dul Muslimin uh, Yahfidun Al-Quran, ya, Lita Korup, Lita Korup Allah. wa litasahul tafhim ma'anil Qur'an ya jadi disebutkan di surah Yunus ayat 57 hmm. ya yuladzina amanu qad ja'atkum ma'adatun mir rabbikum wa syifa'un lima fi sudur wa huda wa rahmatil alamin nah ini dalam ayat tersebut bahwasanya Al-Qur'an bisa berfungsi sebagai uh, rahmat ya kembali kemudian sebagai petunjuk kemudian ada mu'adzatum rabbikum penuh dengan nasihat-nasihat atau petunjuk dari Tuhan dan obat hati. Nah, di sinilah yang kemudian kita atau seorang muslim itu mendekati dalam rangka untuk itu memudahkan atau supaya dapat 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 dari fungsi-fungsi ini. Maaf Bu Lili, waktu tinggal 4 menit lagi. Oh, kok nggak bisa? Kok hang ya? Maaf ini hang, kenapa? Kok tiba-tiba hang? Mungkin lah hafizun itu Bu Lili. Sudah <laughs> deh, saya tekan aja. Iya. Nanti dari panitia yang share ya. Nah. Okay. Uh, ya ini, ini sebenarnya masih banyak ya. Jadi singkatnya adalah ini problematika problematika kita. Mm-hmm. Oke. Okay. Diulang lagi. Ya? Okay. Uh, sorry. Gak bisa man. Gak bisa. Gua coba kamu aja yang share. Nah, pertanyaan berikutnya adalah eh, bagaimana dengan Nabi Muhammad ya sebagai sebagai teladan kita apakah Nabi Muhammad juga hafal Al-Qur'an? Ini kita melihat di surah Al-Qiyamah ayat 16 sampai 19 itu disebutkan di situ bahwasanya ketika malaikat Jibril memberikan wahyu Nabi Muhammad menggerakkan lesannya kemudian ditegur oleh Allah la tuhar bihi lisana kalita aja lebih inale najma'u Qur'ana. Kata, kata Allah, wahai Muhammad, jangan kau gerakkan bibirmu, nggak usah khawatir, kamu pasti hafal gitu ya. Ini retorikanya seperti itu. Bahwasanya Nabi Muhammad menggerakkan bibir karena bagian tanggung jawab seorang Rasul nanti akan me, 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 apa namanya, men-share ayat tersebut ketika Jibril pergi, maka saking takutnya beliau menggerakkan bibirnya. Maka dijawab oleh Tuhan, inna alena jam'ahu wa qur'ana wajiban atas saya, ini kalau retorikanya, wajiba alaiya antul ko ayatul qur'an fi sodrik. Gitu ya. Saya yang bertanggung jawab akan menaruh semua ayat yang sudah dibacakan di dalam dadamu. Dengan apa namanya, jawaban itu, maka Nabi Muhammad menyimak dengan benar, menyimak dengan seksama bacaan Jibril. Ketika Jibril pergi, tiba-tiba Nabi Muhammad bisa menyebutkan itu. Maka ini inilah inilah tafid pada masa Nabi Muhammad ya. Dalam ayat itu dalam ayat itu juga inna alaina jama'u wa qur'ana. Tolong slide-nya mat terus-terus. Nah, ini ya udah. Uh, ini yang metode yang dicontohkan Allah mencontohkan cara mengajarkan Al-Quran ya, kepada Nabi Muhammad tadi adalah yang visudur tadi kalau bedanya Nabi Muhammad langsung hafal metode berikutnya adalah talaki musyafaha harus mengetahui uh, gerakan lesannya berikutnya adalah istimak wal itibak uh, mendengarkan dulu baru mengikuti dan berikutnya adalah al-bayan Inna alaina jama'u qur'ana fa idza qara'na fa tabi'u qur'ana thumma inna alaina bayana di dalam ayat itu thumma inna alaina bayana ada thumma atau huruf ataf thumma itu menunjukkan bahwasanya uh, 
ada beberapa waktu untuk melangkah melangkah berikutnya. Beda dengan huruf atau wawu dan fa. Semua itu agak panjang. Sehingga setelah nanti ini dilakukan oleh beberapa sahabat, ya beliau memutkinkan dulu, me, apa, menguatkan dulu hafalannya, baru kemudian e, me, mengarungi maknanya. Sehingga Ibnu Mas'ud dia mengatakan, e, saya belajar pada Nabi Muhammad, homsan homsan ashran ashran. E, lima lima dulu. Kalau lima udah udah mutkin, benar benar hafal dan mengetahui maknanya, baru berikutnya. E, next, Mak. Nah disinilah. Bagaimana bagaimana hasil akhir dari metode tersebut? Metode yang Allah ajarkan kepada Nabi Muhammad akhirnya melahirkan seorang profil uh, ideal, seorang hafid. Jadi mulai taraf terbawah membaca Al-Qur'an dan dihafalkan, kemudian memahami maknanya sampai menjadi inna uh, wa inna kalau ala khuluqin azim. Nabi Muhammad orang yang Al-Qur'an berjalan kata kata istri beliau Bunda Aisyah. Next Nah ini, uh, jadi Nabi Muhammad di zoom, boleh lihat di zoom nggak nggak berubah gambarnya slide okay. screenshot. Iya makanya. Iya silakan lanjut aja Bu Lili. Iya. Wah ini jadi nggak seru ini. Oke okay. top aja ya. Iya. Kamu bisa ini waktu waktunya Bu Lili. Ya, sudah. Saya kira itu uh, yang penting terakhirnya terakhirnya. Jadi saya ada uh, terkait dengan terkait dengan metode apa namanya uh, tren tafid tadi yang melanda di melanda di kampus-kampus juga. Makanya kita melihat profil itu untuk menepis beberapa anggapan daripada hafal tidak tahu maknanya. Sebenarnya secara Se, secara apa teorinya adalah harus mengetahui maknanya maka yang terakhir terakhir ter, bukan bukan terakhir terus ya ini nih hop, bukan bukan yang tadi yang tadi dia di, di atasnya Iran sebelumnya nah ini nah di sini tawaran terakhir bagi saya adalah tawaran solusinya terkait dengan ada merdeka kampus kampus merdeka Mungkin bisa dipertimbangkan lagi sebenarnya tujuan utama dari uh, ada tafidul Quran masuk kurikulum pasti dulunya bagus ya tapi ke sini ke sininya saya mengajar tafid pasti uh, yang lulus hanya 30% itu ya. Nah, sehingga uh, ini bisa dipakai di ini saya jelaskan lokasi pembinaan bisa dalam luar kampus. Ini bagian dari MBKM. Kemudian bila tidak lulus maka dia akan kuliah seperti biasa. Jika lulus maka dia wajib tanpa ikut kuliah praktikum ibadah dan praktikum dan taktik fadil Quran dia lulus itu dan dimasukkan pada pembinaan pasca tafid di sinilah dan di disinilah kita kita akan memiliki generasi hafid yang bisa uh, uh, itu ya lebih kompleks lebih bagus gitu saya tawaran terakhir saya al tafidul Quran tidak masuk di kurikulum wajib tetap wajib tetapi menjadi keahlian khusus SKPI bila bila tidak dirubah secara sistem uh, pemasukan tafid Al-Qur'an di dalam kurikulum sehingga hasilnya seperti ini terus dari tahun ke tahun. Saya kira itu terima kasih bisa diteruskan dengan dialog. Uh, Oke. Okay. Syukran Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, terima kasih Bu Lilik for sharing your your finding in your research uh, about um, how to say, menjamurnya rumah tafis di Indonesia. And uh, you share also the negative and positive response of Indonesian people. We invite uh, the fourth speaker, uh, Bapak Dr. Muhammad Zulfahmi bin Muhammad. We'll talk about pola pemikiran gerakan orientalis abad ke-8. Orientalis South Uh, patent in 18th century. Uh, time is yours, uh, Pak Muhammad Sulfahmi. Silakan. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Uh, ya, yeah, uh, MC uh, Bapak 
uh, Tekan and uh, all the honorable guests of this uh, seminar. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, first and foremost, thank you for inviting me to this great occasion of seminar. And first, I would like to apologize because my uh, slide is written in uh, Malay. So I try to translate it into mass uh, English, inshallah. So my, uh, I will be talking about um, development of Orientalism movement in 18th century. It is reflected what my colleague, Dr. Munaim Sirri, has mentioned just now. It is, has to do with a chain, of course, of a Quranic study uh, within the framework of uh, uh, Orientalists. So that we start with an introduction, Dahuluan. Long before 18th century, there was Orientalists, but this Orientalism movement I tend to focus on the translation and the philo philological textual Quran and Hadith study. And at the beginning, uh, Muslim was recognized by Western European uh, Muslim as a Sarikan. Okay? And uh, Sarikan was known as a violent uh, from the East. Arab uh, worshipper of uh, pagan gods and so on and so forth. But uh, all this changed immediately after Charmelini, a king of uh, German Empire, uh, stepped into the uh, Orientalism uh, movement. So it is uh, preceded by uh, Peter the Venerable, who was a Cluny uh, from uh, France. Peter Venerable seemed to be reluctant to understand Islam within the hostility that occurred between Muslim world and Western world through crusade war. So he find the way how to uh, understand of Islam and Muslim. So that he met with uh, Robert of Ketten. Uh, my colleague has mentioned his name earlier. Robert of Ketten was an English scholar Arabist. And uh, Peter de Venerable hired uh, Robert of Ketan to translate Al Quran. That was a first recorded Quran translation of Latin. So Peter de Venerable, from started from the starting point of uh, the period, Peter de Venerable understand Islam through its holiest scripture, that is the Quran. That is misunderstanding that let uh, European Western people uh, tend to call Arab as a Sharikan mislead information about worship God and, and so many things about Islam has been clarified by Peter the Venerable. Now, I differentiate, I put stages uh, uh, in the uh, Orientalism development. Uh, into three separate uh, stages. One is a transition uh, period, and number two is the um, Near Eastern language, and the number three is the Romanticism movement in Europe. First, transition period. Methodology pengkajian Orientalis melihatkan perubahan. The methodology of the research of Orientalism is changed very drastically in the 16th century. The timeline from the beginning, which is uh, 10th century to the 16th century, is totally different in the uh, 18th century. From 10th to 16th century, the discourse of Orientalism is just talking about hostility, enmity, prejudice toward Islam and toward, uh, toward uh, uh, Prophet Muhammad and Al-Quran. And this transition period is very important because, because the term of Orientalism is included in the Western uh, dictionary. In this case, French uh, dictionary uh, 
as put uh, uh, orientalism as their own uh, language in the uh, French, uh, French uh, dictionary. Uh, in the same time, uh, 17th century is the new way of Renaissance, new way of uh, uh, new age of uh, or, uh, European race from their dream of the Dark Ages. And thus, this period is known as the Renaissance Ages. And from these ages, there are many uh, 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 sectarian uh, births like uh, humanism, uh, national and secular liberalism, nationalism, progress, progressism, and imperialism, and so on and so forth. French Revolution is main cause of this change, okay? Um, when the French Revolution explode, the society of Western started to rethink about their religion. We assess about their holy scripture, Bible, biblical, and so on. So this meant to the Orientalist movement of uh, Eastern world. Number two, the Near Eastern language and the Arab studies. Um, this is a core when the technology of printing and publishing start to uh, take place in Europe. And thus, encyclopedic and lexical linguistic uh, Arabic uh, widely uh, utilized in European university. And uh, Bibliotheque Oriental uh, is the first, was known as the first bibliographic, uh, Arabic bibliographic that uh, has been, uh, that has, uh, that was produced in 1697. Okay. <clears throat> and within this period of time, the literature, the focus on Arabic literature has been uh, has been known as the uh, golden age of uh, European university back then. Until uh, there were chess of Arabic and Eastern Near Eastern language uh, was introduced in uh, several European uh, university like France and and Britain. And Golden Postel was one of those uh, uh, scholar that produced. Uh, that uh, that was known as Arabis. Okay, he he was occupied at the College of France uh, to chair of Arabic studies. And then, in the UK, in the Brit Brit Britain, Oxford uh, began to establish their chair of Arabic literature in 1640, and was led by uh, Edward Pocock. He was uh, among the earliest Arabists in the UK. Okay, so that uh, since the UK has become uh, uh, powerful, has become uh, solely imperialist power at that time, so that the uh, literatures of Eastern has been uh, collected, has been um, uh, has been collected and uh, put into the uh, library of Oxford. And Edward Peacock was a, uh, a person that is responsible to, uh, to, to deepen the study of the Arabic and the Quranic study through this collected uh, book and literatures. From, from the, this day, the study of uh, Orientalists is no longer about hostility, about a crusade war and so, so on and so forth, but achieve to that extent to focus on the uh, uh, Asia, Asiatic studies, um, area studies okay, uh, within the line of the mission of imperial, imperialism. So that before they go to the unknown world, unexplored land, they must first understand what their custom, what are their uh, religion, what are their way of life. So that before they, uh, they, they come to the world that they, they want to conquer, they know everything about the people of the 
uh, of the uh, colony. It's same goes to the uh, uh, Aceh Kingdom case when um, when uh, the 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 uh, the war between uh, Dutch and Aceh seemed to be uh, seemed to be uh, no way to ending, so that the Dutch royal government has asked Christian uh, Schroederbronje to advise the military uh, advise militarily to a Dutch colony government. Uh, reside in the Vatavia, Jakarta nowadays. It is very important to know about Islam, to know about people before you get to the, to the bottom of the land. So that is the concept of uh, Orientalism in the 18th century. Well, let us go to a uh, uh, period political, uh, political uh, turbulence and um, rise of uh, prejudice thought toward uh, 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 religions institution in Europe. I show you some of the picture that uh, show us how inquisition has been conducted to the uh, European society by their uh, religious men and so on and so forth. And, um, uh, and this trend has triggered the um, hostility uh, from the European, from the Western population against their own uh, nobility, against their own religions, their, their own uh, uh, holy scripture and so on and so forth. And then within this uh, move, uh, within this, uh, uh, I mean, this, uh, this uh, political turbulence, okay, so that some of Orientalists, okay, some of the Orientalists has turned on their religion, okay, has turned side, okay, on their religion, supporting Islam. For example, I tell you, Adrian Rilon, okay, that he he emphasized it is a time for us to European. He addressed this message to the all European, it is our time to give a chance to Muslim to speak uh, for their religion and their own without a prejudice from uh, Orientalists, without a prejudice from uh, from uh, Western. You know, there was a time that uh, Orientalists stigmatizing non-white, non-Western uh, land, Western country, non-Western colony like what happened to uh, Malaysia pre, uh, before uh, uh, Malaysian pre-independent period. One of the uh, um, uh, prominent uh, Orientalist name, R.O. Winstead. R.O. Winstead, when he produced a book that uh, uh, related to, uh, to uh, Malay custom, in, in conclusion, he said that this custom this dance, this religion, and so many things we of Muslim uh, of uh, Malay in the in the in this land are uh, from the uh, from uh, from uh, foreign uh, influence, India, from Arab, from Roman, and so on. There's no uh, there's no uh, innovation that uh, that Malay uh, can do uh, for their civilization. So that this is a uh, uh, stigmatization. Uh, came from uh, uh, Western people uh, such as uh, uh, R.O. Winstead. Is. Okay, I tell you some of an example. Pierre Bay denounced the doctrine of Catholic and uh, respect Islam uh, through uh, its tolerance and logic and compared to uh, Catholic. It is, it, it's uh, it's uh, Pierre Bay was a uh, was a group of dragonites. Uh, back in 90, in, in 1691, where a uh, Catholic uh, uh, clash with a Protestant sectarian. Okay, so um, after that, okay, there were so many books. Uh, very shockingly, uh, impress the the good uh, uh, view on the Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and Islam. Well, and uh, one of those is Mahamud, Mah, uh, Mah, Mahomet Besam, written by uh, uh, Yohan 
uh, Wolfgang von Boes. Okay. Uh, so he produced uh, uh, poets that uh, giving new uh, good uh, impression eh, to Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and uh, depict Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam as the great uh, great uh, people a uh, great, great uh, uh, prophet of the east okay so after this the late 18th century okay there were um, a movement uh, that called uh, romanticism romanticism is raised as a reaction reaction of violence and noble way of life uh, within the uh, uh, within the europe or western uh, society so the definition of romanticism is a romantic movement was an artistic literally musical intellectual movement that originated back in europe at the end of 18th century its characteristic is the nature of romanticism is the uh, reaction is the response uh, from the uh, from the uh, violence from the uh, coup okay that uh, that took part, uh, took place in in in, uh, in several uh, uh, part of uh, europe europe um, and of course uh, revolu uh, industrial revolution has also influenced uh, this romanticism movement which was about, uh, about, uh, about uh, escaping from modern reality. Uh, romanticism was a revolt against the uh, ar uh, aristocratic society, social and political norm of the age of enlightenment, and also a reaction against scientific rationalization of the nature. So that uh, romanticism is the aspect that rarely discussed okay, uh, in the uh, orientalist or occidentalist a discourse. So, for example, Jean Jacques Rousseau, okay, so that uh, uh, he harmonized, uh, reconciled uh, Islam within the frame of European philosophy, within the uh, Western uh, way of life, okay. And the uh, uh, peak of this uh, movement, okay. Uh, uh, can be seen uh, through Antoine Galon, French, uh, French uh, author, uh, when he first time uh, translates uh, um, a book, 1001 Night, uh, okay, uh, to the French, Le Mille in Une Nuit. Okay, this is uh, uh, the um, Antoine Galon uh, pro uh, 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 produced this uh, uh, mystical book. Okay, so that. Uh, from this point of view, we can see uh, the uh, uh, view, the uh, perception of Orientalism towards Islam, towards Arab, towards Eastern has drastically changed after this. Okay, um, as I said uh, earlier, Wolf Goeth uh, uh, eh, through his poem, uh, uh, through his stanza, Mahomet Gesang. Eh? And then uh, we have uh, Robert Suthi uh, in the epic uh, literature uh, entitled the Sa'laba the Destroyer. Okay, so that he uh, admire Islam as a religion that has a principle in moral, principle uh, in the strength of the spiritual, and so on and so forth. But, okay, of course, okay, I just mentioned about the uh, positive aspect of romanticism within the orientalism movement but there are several perceptions that we can uh, take as a precaution okay uh, there is a negative view of romanticism orientalist through islam uh, toward islam for example uh, they have uh, their own stigma their own stigma especially on the uh, uh, Ottoman Empire, especially on the Mughal Empire, so that they look, uh, this seem like uh, to exaggerate uh, the concept of harim, harim, uh, harim uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the uh, Eastern world, okay? Uh, in, our, in our country, we, 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 
we call harim as a uh, dayam dayam istana we call them as a uh, 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 dayam istana okay right. these are the group of uh, erotic romanticists okay so that this group of erotic romanticists tend to depict muslim tend to depict um uh, royalty institution uh, uh, as uh, as uh, upheld uh, harim uh, institution okay one of this uh, institution named lord byron lord byron was uh, an english uh, expatriate who lived in ottoman okay so that he uh, he uh, wrote something about uh, harim very detailed but about Hari, and uh, the book that he produced is a Gayor. Okay, so the Gayor, he depicts eh, uh, that European free eh, Muslim woman from the enslavement, from the Hari cages, from the Hari uh, uh, palace, and so on and so forth. Okay, uh, and uh, apart from the writer of uh, Romanticism, erotic Romanticism. Is the um, is the uh, art okay? Romanticist like uh, Jean Baptiste Van Moor, Theodor Sashiro, and uh, uh, this painter okay uh, basically painted something uh, negative view of a harem and of course erotic and sexual if their own if they are uh, they are uh, okay they are depict uh, uh, they are picture of uh, Islam, of the Muslimah uh, uh, to the Western uh, society. Okay, this uh, picture that uh, I obtained from, uh, okay, one of uh, our romanticist erotic, okay, uh, so that uh, this uh, palace has been used uh, to uh, uh, to place uh, Harim, Harim, this woman, had been uh, taken uh, from uh, several places, uh, be it in India, be it in uh, Southeast Asia, and so on. But this woman are uh, kept uh, uh, in the um, uh, palace and guard by uh, Inuk, okay, a uh, castrated uh, man of God uh, to guard this uh, harim, okay. So this um, photo, okay, I've seen from. Uh, uh, some of uh, website that we can see right now. Okay, so according to Tas Nasir Tai, Orientalist romantic, uh, erotic romanticist is clearly try to depict the negative aspect of Mus uh, of uh, uh, Muslim royal family, Muslim uh, Muslima, and so on. Yes, um, there are several issues that relate to this uh, uh, case but uh, um, in this case i i i tend to uh, give you my opinion that is too much exaggerated okay um the art in islam is not about uh it's not about showing fantasies sensual and sexual erotic but it, 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 in art in islam is about uh, sometimes it's, it's it's about relation to to uh, to the to the world to the to the God and so on. Okay, so this picture has been widely spread to postcard, to uh, album that has been exported through the world of Eastern. So that is uh, something uh, that I can share. Uh, to audience and uh, inshallah I will be uh, uh, answer your question in the next uh, panel uh, discussion inshallah and that's and from me uh, moderator I giving you uh, assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh uh, thank you very much uh, Dr Muhammad Sulfahmi uh, for the presentation. We invite the last presenter, uh, Ibu Saada Tuljana, uh, who will talk about uh, 
what should academic do for some cases of the use and abuse of Quranic understanding? Uh, silakan Ibu Saada. Okay. Okay. Baik. Thank you for the time, Dr. Nov Novizal Wendri as the moderator. And Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. I'm going to share screen. Oh, sorry. Saya nggak bisa share screen dari sini. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Asyhadu an la ilaha illallah wa asyhadu anna Muhammadar Rasulullah. Allahumma shalli ala sayidina Muhammad wa ala ali sayidina Muhammad. Rabbi surahli sadri wa yassirli amri wa hlul 'uqdatam min lisani yafqahu qawli amma ba'd. Oke, di Anarabel the Dean of Faculty of Usuluddin Dr. Yusuf Rahman NMA and the Vice of Jajaran Dekanat Fakultas Usuluddin, Bapak Dr. Profesor Dr. Kuspana MA, Bapak Dr. Lili Ibu Dr. Lili Umika MA dan Bapak Dr. Edwin Syarif MA yang juga hadir secara online. Oke. Okay. Uh, the honorable other invited speakers, uh, Bapak Profesor Dr. Hamidullah Marozi, Bapak Profesor Associate Professor Bapak Dr. Pun uh, Siri and Bapak Dr. Muhammad Zulfahmi. And Ibu Dr. Lili Umi Kalfum. And the all audience who uh, attending to this international conference events. So I would like to uh, say thanks to the committee and the special for the Dean of Fakultas Usuluddin who have uh, given me to being a speaker in here, but I'm not really actually confident to this international conference, but I shall do it. So, in this event, I would like to um, open discussion about the what should academic do for some cases of the use and abuse of Quranic understanding. Um, when I talking about the use and abuse of the Quranic understanding, I mean that uh, I should main map sebab akibat dari uh, why the use and abuse of the Quran of religion or religion is happen. So I think that Quran, the function of Quran is informative and performative function. Okay, so the informative for the Quranic function is when the people or believer who studied in the Quranic studies is to elaborate uh, the content of the Quran itself by uh, the elaborating the history, uh, the interpretative uh, perspective, but the performative is who Quran, which is Quran is alive in the community. So because of religion has the text, sacred text, uh, even if the Bible, even if the Quran, so the Quran itself is belief as the hudan for the believer even in community, in individual and authoritative figure. So I call the community such as uh, academic community who, uh, who read and 
understand the Quran and community social authority and understanding the Quran with different way to understand the Quran. So every individual, every community and authoritative figure doing the process interpreting and understanding the Quran. It means that by the process and in the uh, different process of interpreting and understanding the Quran, result the some point of view to understand the Quran. I mean that when someone or when a mufasir interpret the Quran, they position their self as the traditionalist, as the moderate, as the liberal and extremist. That their mindset, the point of view, has influenced to the uh, interpret to the Quran, to understanding to the Quran. So, I mean that opening up discussion is because every believer from different point of view utilize the Quran for for positive and negative purposes. So I illustrate that the use and abuse of the Quran because there is misunderstood and misunderstanding of the Quranic use. Okay, so what I call the use and abuse as general. Uh, karena tidak, maksudnya uh, tidak ada hal yang baku apa yang disebut dengan penggunaan dan penyalahgunaan Al-Quran. So, I trying to, I am trying to uh, mind map what is the use and abuse in the Quranic uh, understanding. When I refer to the dictionary, the use and abuse is as a process and using something and the, the abuse is uh, an action of abuse. So, when when we call the abuse is there is an action of abuse okay when i refer to the case of the use and abuse of religion or the quranic understanding based on religion is there is misunderstanding and misuse of the quran for politic economic or social education purposes and when i refer to general cases that happen for example that we, uh, when we call uh, penyalahgunaan narkoba because of narkoba itu menjadi sesuatu yang dilarang oleh sosial struktur sosial yang ada misalnya Indonesia maka ketika itu digunakan oleh masyarakat atau individual itu menjadi sebuah kasus penyalahgunaan begitu pun misalnya kasusnya di negara lain Eropa dan lain sebagainya karena tidak semua negara itu mengizinkan penggunaan legal pada uh, penggunaan narkoba gitu sehingga itu menjadi sebuah penyalahgunaan. So, when I refer to the values what means to the use and abuse of the Quranic understanding is when the case is happen and the use and abuse of Quranic studies happen must be there is a break rule and break values from the Quranic text, so we can uh, we can found that um, in Quranic uh, in Quranic studies there is uh, in information and value that can be become a role model, and in the social culture in the community we have a value. So, jadi ketika kalau kita misalnya menyatakan bahwa itu penggunaan dan penyalahgunaan itu pasti menyalah menyalahi daripada nilai-nilai Al-Qur'an dan nilai-nilai sosial struktur yang ada yang disepakati bersama bahwa itu adalah nilai-nilai yang positif. And last when I refer to the previous research that uh, written by Azumar Di Azra, Johanna Ping, Kenneth De Wall, Therese William, Ivan Ive uh, Kovic, Jeffrey Trehman, Amrita Fikat Rahman, and others. They say that when the use and abuse in religion, when the use and abuse of religion and Quranic text is using always always used for political, economical, uh, business, uh, and social education purposes. 
Why? Because Azra said and Pink said that um, when we involving the religion for the political, economical, uh, business purpose, they have a uh, more benefit. So when religion involving to the every time, every single purpose in the world, we have a benefit. Because why? Yeah, Richard also say that uh, there is no believer who disloyal with their religion. So the religion is uh, is the most important thing to apa namanya membentuk dunia apa membentuk mempengaruhi sikap kemudian uh, apa mempengaruhi cara berpikir mempengaruhi niat dan lain sebagainya itu sehingga banyak persoalan-persoalan kehidupan yang tidak bisa dipisahkan meskipun di beberapa negara uh, apa namanya mencoba di beberapa riset itu menyatakan bahwa agama dipisah dengan persoalan politik tetapi pada kenyataannya ketika itu terjadi tidak bisa itu ya karena itu yang tadi si uh, Richard bilang bahwa there is no believer who is loyal with religion oke okay. so I assume that the Quranic use and abuse uh, when the abuse of the Quranic understanding not only misunderstanding or misuse of the Quran, but there is a victim on the case of the use and abuse. Okay. So I bring the some cases for the use and abuse that happening in Indonesia because uh, I think that uh, ini sangat penting karena sebenarnya yang uh, kenapa sebenarnya di kita di Indonesia khususnya itu uh, meskipun itu tidak salah uh, seperti yang di apa namanya disampaikan oleh Prof Munaim Siri barusan bahwa kajian yang sedang yang menarik atau misalnya yang rises today itu terkait dengan literatur misalnya terkait dengan um, apa namanya language bilingual approaches and uh, itu tetapi menurut saya itu karena bagian itu adalah daripada perspektif barat, itu juga bagus. Tetapi eh, saya mencoba untuk memapping bahwa ada kasus-kasus di komunitas muslim, tentu saja bagian komunitas muslim terbesar, sehingga menurut saya ini lebih, eh, kenapa kita tidak mencoba mengambil itu untuk mendapatkan data-data riset. Sehingga bagian kajian Quranic Studies itu tidak hanya pada literatur studies. Kita mencoba untuk menyatukan atau tujuan e, riset itu apakah hanya untuk menyatakan itu e, apa namanya makna-makna di dalam Al-Quran atau Quran itself as historical and social e, yang hidup di dalam ruang sosial dan lain sebagainya, tetapi tidak sedikit, tidak banyak maksud saya, tidak banyak yang mengkaji dari sisi apakah pesan-pesan yang disampaikan Al-Quran itu memang di oleh community itu secara benar atau tidak. Oke. Sebelumnya misalnya Ibu Dr. Lili Umi Kalsum sudah menyebut bahwa apa namanya institusi-institusi eh, tahfiz misalnya di Indonesia itu menjamur. The increasing number of eh, tahfiz institution. So, Sebenarnya tanpa kita apa namanya tanpa kita me, ini tanpa kita me, terjun kepada penelitian itu kita sudah sangat bisa melihat bahwa tujuan utamanya itu ya bisnis tujuan utamanya bisnis so apakah ini salah atau tidak nah, menurut saya ini adalah bagian dari seharusnya komuniti uh, akademik untuk melihat itu. itu. Itu salah satunya sudah tadi disebut oleh Ibu Dr. Rumi Kalsum sebelum. Oke, okay. I would like to bring the some cases that happening in, uh, in Juli, in one month ago, uh, kasus yang terjadi di ACT. Uh, kenapa saya ini menjadikan kasus ini sebagai kasus yang masuk dalam Quranic understanding or religion karena yang menjadi founder di situ 
mayoritas yang bekerja di situ itu adalah muslim. Sehingga saya mengklaim bahwa adanya apa namanya institusi itu berdiri ya karena memang urusan kemanusiaan. Dan itu satu visi dengan nilai-nilai yang ada di dalam Al-Quran. But pada kenyataannya, berdirinya institusi itu tidak hanya mempunyai niat-niat positif. At the same time, they only the negative purposes. Misalnya, negative purpose-nya itu apa? Misalnya, mereka mengambil setiap apa namanya itu yang menyata, ini yang menyatakan adalah ininya sendiri leadernya Ibnu Hajar said at the press conference he said that every year ACT took 13.7 for fund, uh, for uh, uh, for institution and leader use sehingga itu haknya institusi untuk menggunakan itu apakah itu salah? Menurut saya ya ada salah dan ada tidaknya tergantung daripada komposisi komposisi komposisinya. Kenapa ini saya bilang abuse? Ya karena komposisinya penggunaannya itu tidak sesuai. Karena ada diskriminasi di antara itu sehingga saya sebut ini adalah abuse. So uh, if audience tuh, uh, apa kalau misalnya audience ingin mengetahui silakan uh, cek uh, ini ya berita yang ber, uh, berita yang ini yang apa namanya yang bersangkutan dengan ACT itu banyak sekali. So the other cases is about sexual abuses and exploitation about child minor that happen in educational institution. Padahal kan sebenarnya lembaga institusi pendidikan itu untuk membentuk anak menjadi uh, karakter yang lebih baik setidaknya at least gitu. Tetapi kita mengetahui dan ini fakta bersama kita mengetahui bahwa di institusi edukasi atau institusi pendidikan kita di Indonesia itu ada beberapa yang masih menyimpang gitu dengan alasan apa agama itu ya misalnya kasus yang terjadi di sekolah Selamat Pagi Indonesia gitu misalnya ada beberapa korban tetapi hanya satu korban yang melapor they uh, Share some story in the some YouTube podcast for getting a justice. So mereka itu sudah melapor, tetapi apa namanya di denial. They got a denial from the structure in the institution. So, the same case is happen in Pesantren Sitkiah Jombang. The son of the Kiai, his name is Becky. Also, did the sexual uh, sexual abuse dengan alasan agama. Nah, bagi saya ini adalah sebuah yang harus diluruskan dengan riset riset akademik. Uh, maksudnya adalah untuk mengurangi hal-hal ini terjadi, gitu. sehingga ada data-data yang uh, kemudian menjadi riset akademik dan itu menjadi panduan bahwa. Um, apa seberapa besar sebenarnya kasus-kasus ini terjadi mungkin saja ada kasus-kasus di luar sana karena pesantren di Indonesia itu sangat banyak dan institusi-institusi pendidikan itu sangat banyak even itu swasta maka kita tidak pernah tahu bahwa di dalamnya itu bisa saja terjadi lebih banyak tentang kejahatan seksual misalnya eksploitasi anak dan lain sebagainya itu so the next uh, the next case is about poligami Ya, yeah. what I call this as the religious abuse. We know that polygamy is uh, the case that always happen, always discussing by community academic, by uh, domestic, domestic family and other. Because we we realize that in the polygamy practice there is abuse, but we cannot do it for at least uh, declining these cases. For example, some research by uh, Emin Oxtuh, Ahmed Sehan, Dena Aleya, yang meriset tentang apa namanya kasus-kasus poligami baik itu yang terjadi di dunia muslim selain Indonesia misalnya di Amerika karena di Amerika ada juga masyarakat muslim terus di Arab juga ada masyarakat muslim mereka menyatakan bahwa poligami itu 
ini sebagai sebuah apa namanya penyalahgunaan agama sebagai sebuah legitimasi kebenaran bagi orang-orang khususnya mereka bilang adalah otoritatif figur siapa itu otoritatif figur ya preacher ulama uh, maybe clergy uh, atau pastor gitu ya. ada salah satu riset yang uh, menyatakan juga bahwa di saya saya lupa di mananya tetapi ia fokus bahwa seksual abuse dilakukan di oleh seorang pastor sehingga sebenarnya kasus-kasus ini terjadi tidak hanya di Islam di luar pun sama kasus ini, kasus ini menjadi sebuah kasus yang seharusnya agama itu menjadikan pribadi untuk mengenal Tuhan misalnya untuk memperbaiki diri menjadi pribadi yang lebih baik but at the fact that itu kasus-kasus tersebut bahkan akan misalnya mengurangi kepercayaan seseorang terhadap agama sehingga kemudian muncul orang-orang yang mempunyai pendapat bahwa hidup di dunia itu beragama tidak penting yang penting itu adalah tanggung jawab dia sebagai agama dan sebagai manusia tuh so uh, ya yeah, itu so, uh, the next cases I mean that uh, when we talking about the use and abuse is most related to the political case in every state uh, specific, specifically in Indonesia so terrorism when we talking about terrorism kasus terorisme itu mulai dari tahun 19 hingga saat ini itu di apa namanya ya diidentikan dengan Islam karena beberapa ayat yang berbicara dengan jihad dan kemudian sekelompok atau the group number of extremists kemudian mempraktikkan itu sebagai jalan jihad meskipun ini sudah beberapa kali misalnya atau sudah disampaikan oleh kalangan akademis lainnya dan merespon tentang interpretasi ayat itu bahwa ayat itu adalah salah tetapi ini tidak bisa menafikan bahwa hal itu terjadi terorisme itu terjadi dan lain sebagainya oke okay. the other cases is about religious blasphemy that happened in 2016 space uh, kenapa saya kemudian memberi contoh kasus ahok ini sebagai kasus uh, penyalahgunaan agama atau penyalahgunaan uh, Quranic understanding karena kasus ini menjadikan sebuah apa pandangan akademik yang kemudian merespon banyak struktur manusia mulai dari masyarakat biasa misalnya merespon ini mulai dari kalangan akademis organisasi Islam terbesar kemudian tokoh-tokoh akademis kiai dan lain sebagainya ini merespon fenomena yang terjadi pada saat itu sebenarnya This is when we refer to the law on to uh, legal to the legal this is the blasphemy because uh, ah yeah, terbukti melakukan penistaan agama but to the different side for the uh, other perspective for the example when we uh, refer to the academic or the perspective of to the meaning al-maidah itu sendiri boleh saja kita menyatakan bahwa itu Ahok misalnya tidak meng, uh, tidak melakukan uh, apa namanya uh, religious blasphemy itu uh, ya yeah, itu so the other cases juga yang kemudian booming pada saat itu kenapa saya sebut ini adalah bagian dari kasus-kasus politik yang mengatasnamakan agama itu gerakan 212 karena itu muncul dan eksis hanya pada masa-masa tertentu sehingga itu saya sebut itu sebagai sebuah motif-motif politik pada saat itu karena apa ya karena ketika kasusnya sudah berlalu kasusnya sudah selesai misalnya mereka tidak eksis sehingga mereka eksis ketika ada apa political political event yang terjadi yang mereka kemudian mempunyai tempat untuk menyuarakan pendapat mereka tentang apa tentang peranan Islam. So, 
uh, the next is uh, I mean that the fact of Quranic studies that I mentioned before bahwa sebenarnya yang ini adalah perspektif saya nanti kalau kemudian uh, audience uh, tidak setuju disagree and uh, one and be uh, giving equality for me I open oke okay. sebenarnya kajian Quran itu sekarang atau kita melihat misalnya kajian-kajian uh, Quranic studies itu cenderung lebih banyak Misalnya, elaborate the Quran itself by explaining the meaning, the context in the Quran, the knowledge based on the Quran, and describing the different interpreter perspective. So, um, this claim is based on nine from uh, ini ada claim ini adalah berdasarkan sembilan dari sepuluh kajian tafsir. Itu adalah kajian yang mengungkap Quran itu sendiri. Gitu. So. By contrast, Quranic studies which is live in Muslim community specifically studies that focus on critic. Jadi tidak banyak misalnya kajian Quran yang memberikan kritik secara eksplisit apa-apa Quran yang hidup dipahami oleh seorang believer. Gitu. Baik itu secara individual misalnya baik itu di dalam komunitas akademik, baik itu Quran yang hidup di dalam misalnya organisasi-organisasi Islam tertentu, karena dipastikan itu pasti berbeda. Itu, menurut saya perbedaan itu ya muncul karena yang pertama pemahaman itu e, turun temurun, mulai dari tokoh otoritatif kemudian dipahami oleh e, apa namanya oleh pe, penganutnya atau pengikutnya dan lain sebagainya, kemudian itu menjadi sebuah mindset sebuah mindset yang juga mempengaruhi tingkah laku, pola pikir dan lain sebagainya. Itu. So, menurut saya challenge karena uh, International Conference ini berbicara tentang challenge, maka menurut saya eh uh, apa ya, ke depan itu harus ada academic short move to the empirical studies by taking into account to the case which is break the value of Quran and social culture community. Artinya harus ada kritik di dalamnya ketika itu mengkaji tentang Quran which is alive in the Muslim communities. And the other challenge is cooperation. Kenapa saya bilang cooperation, kerjasama? Karena sebetulnya uh, kesempatan-kesempatan kita untuk mendapatkan data, karena saya mencari di Google itu, tidak ada data yang spesifik tentang misalnya penyalahgunaan agama oleh institusi, penyalahgunaan agama oleh bla 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 bla. Itu saya tidak temukan. Sehingga sebenarnya ini menjadi sebuah kesempatan dan challenge untuk universitas itu menjalin kerjasama riset. Misalnya kerjasama riset untuk mendapatkan data-data apa ya penyelewangan, penyelewengan, penyalahgunaan dan lain sebagainya itu yang terkait dengan agama dan pemahaman Al-Qur'an yang ada di dalamnya di institusi tersebut. Itu. Ini adalah uh, pendapat saya. So, I have the conclusion. Uh, ada konklusi ini saya ambil dari penelitiannya Asef Bayat di dalam artikel yang dipublish oleh Chicago Journal ini sangat banyak, tetapi uh, beliau menyatakan seperti ini. Uh, bahwa kajian kajian yang khusus uh, atau misalnya melibatkan agama dengan komunitas muslim itu advantages-nya sangat banyak sekali. gitu Sehingga itu mampu memunculkan apa-apa yang terjadi uh, misalnya di ruang publik, produktivitas pengetahuan, kekerasan, kultural politik, representation dan others itu. Ya, saya pikir itu saja ya. Uh, terima kasih untuk atensinya. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much uh, Ibu Sada. Luar biasa sekali ya uh, risetnya uh, bagaimana ayat-ayat Al-Qur'an disalahgunakan pemahamannya untuk Uh, keperluan politik dan lain sebagainya. Baik di audiens, uh, we have uh, finish five presentation from the five speakers and we go to the next session is question answer. Di ruangan chat itu ada beberapa pertanyaan. 
some answer in chat room. And I have uh, arranged, uh, there is a question for uh, Professor Marazi. After that, uh, Professor Munaim Siri, Bu Lili, dan juga ada komentar uh, terhadap Ibu Saada. We give the first time for uh, Professor Marazi from Kustan, Fakulti Usuludin Win Sharif Dakwa Jakarta. He asked you, uh, you mentioned something about logis earlier. To what extent do you agree or disagree that Quranic studies, Hadith studies, Islamic philosophies, Islamic jurisprudence, and other related studies should introduce and deliver the modern or symbolic logic, in which case it refused the Aristotelian peripatetic principle of non-contradiction to our student. And juga ada dari Muhammad Babul Ulum, I think it's related to Professor Marazi. In the Quran, there are many, many ayat uh, said, afala ta'kilun, afala tatafakkarun, afala tatadabbarun, and uh, it is, uh, we don't find afala tahfazun. I think it's related to uh, Ibu Lili, yeah. I think uh, after that, uh, from for Professor Munim, I, uh, excuse me, I want to share the, the question. I, screen this question uh. should i respond yeah okay uh, okay th thank you very much um, for the very good question uh, basically there is mention of tafakkur tadabbur taqul hikmah ilm and all such type of terms which are uh, terms of epistemology theory of knowledge and which pertain to science as well as philosophy and rationalism. So far as Hafiz is concerned, so there is, it has been It is included in this verse that people have to definitely remember Quran by heart. And much, it has been said at many times, and it has been told, it has been said to the Prophet that you should not make hurry to remember the Quran, we will make it uh, to get remembered by you and by others uh, by implication. So in this way, these all terms are there, these are implied. And Prophet Sallallahu in his different ahadith has given much emphasis on remembering Quran by heart. So in this way, the mention of Hifaz is there in the Quran and Hadith by implication. And secondly, these all terms, taqul, tadabur, tafakkur, so these all terms have different connotations. For example, so far as uh, you know, Akal is concerned, that seems to be related to common sense. And so far as Tafaku is concerned, that is related to social affairs, social sciences. And so far as Tafaku is concerned, that is mostly used in context of their worldly science and the heavenly bodies and pondering on one's own self and the signs which are scattered in the universe. And so far as Hikmah is concerned, Hikmah is encompassing all these meanings. And then it has been said, Hikmah has been described by our scholars like Ibn Rushd as science or as philosophy. And those days philosophy and science used to be one and the same thing because philosophy was including all the subjects. And in the estimation of uh, Al-Kindi, there were 37 sciences which were included in philosophy. There was the chemistry was there, mathematics was there, logic was there, and uh, arithmetic was there, and politics was there, uh, logic was there, exology was there, meteorology was there, medicine was there. So in this way, if we take, you know, this uh, classical meaning of the hikmah, then all the sciences were included in that in a sense. So in this way, we can say that these are very comprehensive terms which have been used in the Quran and which have been explained by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And later on by the scholars like Imam Ghazali, Razi, Ibn Taymiyyah, 
Ibn Rushd and Mullah Rumi and Shahullah Dahliya of India and other scholars, even uh, some scholars from Indonesia and Malaysia also later on, Naqib al Atas and uh, you know, others, they have also mentioned about these terms and they have given them a very vast uh, meaning and which includes all the fields and spheres of philosophy, science and technology and such other type of you know, technical studies. So in this way, we can find that there is the mention of you know, tafakkur tadabur, but also of the hifz in by implication. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much for the answer, Professor. Uh, next question for Professor Mun Imsiri. Uh, I I can show in the screen. Uh, dari Asrar Mabrur Faza from Langsa. Uh, saya sangat tertarik apa yang telah disampaikan Prof. Munim, terutama terkait dengan editing Quran. Saya kira kita perlu untuk menyusun Quran versi Pratawatur. Maksud saya setidaknya ada beberapa ayat Quran via riwayat ahad yang sahih yang tidak tercantum dalam mushaf Quran sekarang. Sementara Ayat-ayat sempalan Quran via riwayat ahad itu sudah bertebaran di berbagai buku ulumul Quran dan juga di kitab Masahif Ibni Abi Daud. Jadi perlu menyusun ulang Quran Pratra Tawatur dengan memasukkan kembali ayat-ayat itu ke dalam mushaf saat ini. Dan tentu saja ini adalah agenda akademis kita ke depan. Pertanyaan saya, sejauh mana peluang editing Quran ini bisa segera terwujud di lingkungan Akademik Tanah Air. Itu pertanyaan yang pertama. Dari uh, Asrar Mabrur Faza. Juga dari uh, Kuston. Uh, you said that uh, the mic be a short of intertextual dialogue between the Holy Quran the, and the Holy Bible. Given that both holy books came out from the same cultural environment. How do you address the historical contradiction of Jesus Hawk, the ancient Aramaic, but uh, that a Catholic church has always been putting Latin as the secret language of Catholicism and uh, the New Statement? How could such intertextual dialogue be possible with respect of such historical contradiction? Ada beberapa untuk Prof. Munim dari Ustad. Ustan juga ada dari uh, Pak Yusuf Raman, dari Pak Dekan, yang menanyakan uh, another question to Prof. Mun in Siri. Uh, I, I understand that you have a new book which, it, which will be published soon, entitled The Quran with Cross Reference. Looking at the title, many will assume that uh, it is conservative and normative study, but how can you are due for its critical and academic study. Silakan Pak Munim. Halo Prof Munim. Mungkin Baik. sudah terpaksa. Sorry. Um... Saya jawab dulu yang pertama tentang edisi kritis ya, apakah itu memungkinkan. Sebenarnya usaha seperti yang sudah saya singgung, usaha untuk membuat uh, Quran edisi kritis itu um, sudah dimulai sejak awal, um, sejak abad 19 sebenarnya dengan menghimpun berbagai manuskrip yang ada, itu kemungkin, uh, kemudian uh, apa namanya dicoba untuk di, apa, direkonstruksi Al-Quran dengan melibatkan berbagai manuskrip gitu, tetapi um, disebutkan bahwa uh, dua, dua orang yang merencanakan edisi kritis itu uh, pertama mereka <laughs> mati mendadak gitu, um, yang kedua uh, kumpulan manuskrip yang dihimpun itu disebutkan uh, apa hancur karena perang dunia kedua ya, per, de, de, apa, kena bom gitu. Tapi ternyata uh, manuskrip itu selamat dari uh, dari bom perang dunia kedua dan sekarang uh, sedang diteliti oleh 
beberapa sarjana uh, di Jerman yang dipimpin oleh Angelika Nuawit. Um, so kita memang berharap akan ada edisi uh, apa, Quran edisi kritis gitu. Uh, di Indonesia saya kira uh, sulit akan uh, dilakukan karena pertama kita tidak punya uh, sumber-sumber yang memungkinkan kita melakukan uh, proyek besar itu gitu. Um, for um, concerning uh, contradiction that Jesus spoke in Aramaic while the Bible mostly at least in the Middle Ages were written in um, in, in Latin. So um, there is no such contradiction actually because even though the yes it is true that that Jesus spoke in Aramaic but the Bible is not written in Aramaic but rather it is written in Greek. Uh, but then um, written in in uh, in Latin. So when when I when I encourage the possibility of intertextual dialogue um, that the Quran is in dialogue with the Bible uh, and arguing that perhaps it is more fruitful to think of the Bible and the Quran that emerge within um, the same culture media. The argument that I, I you know, I, I try to put forward was that um, if you look at the text of the Quran, you will find in every uh, page a reference to biblical literature. Um, uh, you find biblical figures from Adam to Jesus, as well as biblical narrative. So the story of Adam, the story of Noah, the story of Moses and so forth. Uh, which seem to uh, resonate what we find in the Bible. So if we look at the text of the Quran, you see this kind of resonance. You, 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 find, uh, you find some uh, biblical references or some, some scholars call as uh, biblical materials uh, in, in the Quranic text. So what, what does this uh, phenomenon uh, you know, tell us about um, you know, the Quran interaction with pre-Quranic literature. Uh, one thing that struck me uh, when looking at the text of the Quran and how similar uh, the, 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 the narrative, uh, you know, that we find in both scriptures, that, uh, that the audience of the Quran must have been very familiar with both with, 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 with biblical narrative. So when, when I said that, yeah, that, that, that intertextual dialogue will be fruitful, I was thinking about um, about you know um, the way in which the Bible has been uh, translated into Aramaic and developed by um, uh, Syriac authors. Uh, if you're familiar with the work of uh, Jacob of Soro, for instance, uh, you see how similar the Quranic narrative. Um, you know, if you look at uh, you know if if you, if you uh, compare the work of uh, Jacob of Soro and the, the Quranic uh, narrative concerning um, uh, the creation of Adam when in the Quran you find that God asked uh, the angel to bow down to Adam you will not find this story in the Bible but you will find similar story in the work of Syriac writer at the time so that what I mean by uh, that that the Bible, the Quran, and parabiblical literature might have immersed within the same cultural milieu. So, um, so there is no con contradiction uh, because the, you know the Bible uh, has been uh, you know discussed um, and developed by uh, by Syriac authors, as as we know that Syriac is the lingua franca of Christians before the coming of Islam. Uh, so yes, Mas Yusuf. Um, yeah, um, the book that I prepared for a long time, the Quran with course reference, will uh, come out shortly, uh, perhaps um, on uh, September 19 uh, this year. So uh, is it the work of uh, the work that that re that represent uh, my faith? Yes, it is certainly represent my faith. But but I began um, this project, this book project. When I participated in uh, in the conference organized by Gabriel a long time ago, it's called the Quran uh, the Quran seminar. Uh, so the Quran itself encouraged the participant to read the Quran on its own terms, rather than relying on the tafsir traditions. So the work that I tried to produce the Quran with course reference follow this kind of method. So as as you know well that in the past few years there's a shift in Quranic studies 
from relying on the Quran, on the on the tafsir tradition, to relying on the text of the Quran itself. How to read the Quran either synchronically or diachronically, di 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 uh, understanding the text on the basis of the text of the Quran itself, rather than uh, on rather than uh, relying on 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 the tafsir tradition. So the Quran with cross reference is. Um, is a, a, a book project that that is in line with this kind of approach. How to understand the Quran on its own term, which is um, one of the mo one of the most recent uh, you know uh, development in Quranic studies. As you know, that that more you know uh, most uh, uh, Quran scholar today seem to uh, focus on the text of the Quran. Um, so the reason why uh, you know the, the the study on Quranic manuscript is so important today and emerged as a, as an important subfield in Quranic studies because of this emphasis on the text of the Quran. So uh, so my work, um, the Quran with course reference, um, is in line with this kind of. I I I don't think that this is a Quranic approach. But rather, um, how important it is to read the Quran on its own term. So, so that's that's basically the main idea behind the course, the Quran with cross reference. Of course, you know the Bible has been cross reference for a long time. So, the cross reference of the Bible has been long traditions. But unfortunately, the Quran has not been cross reference. So, my book is is the first you know the first book of its kind. So, the Quran has not been it's not been cross reference. Although Quranic commentators from quite early on recognized the importance of understanding the Quran uh, uh, through the Quran itself. So tafsir, tafsir Quran bir Quran is regarded by Muslim scholars from quite early on as the most important method to understand the Muslim scripture. Uh, but as we know so well that, that you know, no work has been done uh, to produce uh, this kind of work. So. I'm 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 quite happy with 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 this this project. Yeah. Ini ada lagi satu lagi mungkin Prof uh, dari Munawir Munawar Khalil. Uh, jadi uh, apa mungkin ada apa namanya revisi ulang terhadap mushaf? Nah, itu kan selama ini kita menganggap uh, itu sudah final saja dengan adanya fakta-fakta uh, fakta sejarah itu yang ditemukan kalau direkonstruksi ulang apa mungkin gitu Oh Bagaimana? sekarang sedang oh, rekonstruksi ulang sejarah Al-Quran itu sedang berlangsung ya yeah. um, uh, secara tradisional kita memang uh, memahami bahwa Al-Quran itu uh, dikodifikasi uh, dalam periode yang sangat awal pada pada Abu Bakar Utsman Uh, masalahnya adalah sumber-sumber Islam sendiri itu memberikan uh, ruang bagi upaya rekonstruksi ulang terhadap uh, sejarah tradisional yang kita tahu itu gitu. Karena kalau kita misalnya baca karya uh, Ibn Abi Dawud al sijistani Kitabul Masuhif, misalnya ya, kalau kita baca kitab itu, kita akan disuguhkan dengan narasi bahwa pada masa uh, Khalifah kelima Bani Umayyah Abdul Malik bin Marwan bersama uh, gubernurnya di Irak namanya Hajjaj bin Yusuf itu disebutkan mereka membentuk satu komisi untuk men, apa, memproduksi Al-Quran ya. nah pertanyaannya apa saja yang dilakukan mereka itu gitu. ya. apakah sekedar uh, meresmikan mushaf yang dimiliki Usman atau ada diskusi-diskusi lain yang terjadi di kalangan di kalangan komi, apa, anggota komisi yang dibentuk oleh Abdul Malik bin Marwan. Nah, tampaknya uh, mereka tidak hanya mengofisialkan Musab Usman, tetapi ada perdebatan yang cukup hidup di antara uh, anggota komite. Salah satunya yang yang biasa saya yang sering saya sebutkan itu penambahan alif ke dalam Al Quran. Jadi salah uh, salah seorang yang yang terlibat dalam dalam proyek itu adalah Ubaidullah bin Ziyad yang disebutkan dalam Kitabul Masohif menambahkan 2000 alif ke dalam Al-Qur'an. Jadi zada alfai alifin. Jadi 2000 alif ke dalam Al-Qur'an. Belum lagi bahwa uh, apa namanya? rosem rosem bahasa Arab dulu kan tidak seperti yang kita lihat sekarang. Jadi ada penambahan titik um, uh, apa namanya? untuk membedakan antara satu 
huruf dan huruf lain. Jadi um, jadi apa yang uh, dilakukan oleh Abdul Malik bin Marwan oleh salah seorang muslim uh, yang sedang melakukan uh, studi tentang itu di Amerika itu disebut se sebagai uh, uh, pro proyek mushaf kedua. Nah, ini ya. ini merupakan ini satu upaya untuk merekonstruksi ulang tentang sejarah Al-Qur'an yang selama ini kita paham dan 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 sekarang sedang berlangsung upaya uh, apa namanya memikirkan ulang walaupun mungkin kata revisi agak sensitif memikirkan yeah. ulang tentang sejarah Al-Qur'an. Oke, okay. luar biasa sekali Prof. Uh, uh, saya akan bacakan uh, three question for uh, Ibu Lili and after setelah membaca pertanyaan yang ada di luangan chat room uh, nanti uh, A participant, you can ask directly to the speakers. Uh, we still have time. Uh, untuk Ibu Lili, uh, itu ada pertanyaan dari uh, apa, apa pertanyaan atau sekedar gagasan saja ya dari Muhammad Babul Ulum, Bapak Babul Ulum. Uh, ya sama tadi sudah diref Diaspon juga oleh uh, Pak Medullah, tapi ini uh, re re related to your your research dalam Al Quran ya. uh, bertebaran ayat-ayat berbunyi afalat takfilun, afalat tafakarun itu, cuman tidak ada yang seperti yang dihidupkan oleh lembaga tahfiz itu afalat tahfazun. Ya. Kemudian uh, from Khairuddin Yusuf, uh, according to Bu Lili, uh, uh, what is the main factor? Uh, yang melatar belakangi berjamurnya rumah tafis di Indonesia. Tadi memang sudah disinggung masalah komersialisasi dan lain sebagainya. Nah, juga mungkin itu dulu yang bisa uh, saya tangkap dari ruangan chat. Silakan Bu Lili. Baik. Uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Terima kasih atas perhatiannya karena memperhatikan jadi ada pertanyaan jadi terima kasih ya untuk mengembangkan uh, penelitian saya karena waktu memang sangat singkat jadi tidak bisa melaporkan keseluruhan uh, tadi saya katakan bahwasanya tidak adalah sebuah ide itu negatif semua dan positif semua Pastinya yang namanya rumah tafid itu ya sama dengan mungkin dia adalah kepanjangan tangan dari awal dulu adanya pesantren tafid. Pastinya nawa itu awalnya pasti adalah bagus. Ya tadi saya katakan karena ini keterbatasan waktu juga PPT juga dibatasin. Jadi yang saya laporkan Uh, kalau yang positif itu sudah jelas lah ya karena untuk menciptakan generasi Qurani untuk bisa memper, memperbanyak memperbanyak jumlah hafid yang profesional kemudian bisa lebih memperkenalkan Al-Qur'an sejak usia dini itu banyak ya tidak saya sebutkan tadi yang positif itu karena sudah sangat-sangat normatif dan bisa diketahui bagi saya karena saking banyaknya pertanyaan ke saya dan apa ya tanda tanda tutup itu uh, uh, melawan istilahnya untuk apa ibu bikin pesantren ibu, untuk apa ya ibu bikin rumah tafid sana sana sini sini mengapa demikian nah ini kemudian uh, kita himpun gitu nah ternyata memang uh, kita tarik ke atas semua ide itu pasti ada uh, apa positif negatif ya positif negatif di CCP ada yang ternyata di, 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 di apa namanya ditumpangi ada yang ternyata berniat ini memang ya jadi ada rumah tafid yang eh, gurunya itu datang ke saya ke rumah saya dan dia mengatakan eh, saya mau ngaji ke Ibu Jaja. Saya bilang kamu sudah jadi ha, sudah sudah guru di sana. Rumah tafidnya udah besar. Iya Bu, sebenarnya saya nggak nggak bisa apa-apa gitu ya. Istilahnya eh, tapi eh, santrinya banyak. Ini salah satu saya bilang tadi kausuistik ya. Tetapi tidak bis, tid, saya dan saya tidak menilai kemudian 
uh, mengeneralisir tidak tetapi dalam rangka adalah ini loh wacan ini loh fenomena yang ada di antara kita ada plus ada minus itu ya jadi uh, otomatis faktornya bukan komersial itu justru saya mengetengahkan ini loh ternyata tidak tidak uh, sekedar yang positif saja ternyata ada satu dua yang itu kurang bagus gitu ya maka di sini warning untuk beberapa wali murid eh wali ya bener uh, uh, orang tua yang akan menaruh anaknya supaya melihat betul sejarahnya berdirinya kemudian uh, input outputnya cara pembinaannya, cara metodenya dan lain sebagainya sehingga tidak terjadi seperti beberapa orang yang e, pernah lacurhat ke saya ternyata begini, ternyata begitu gitu ya secara hasilnya. Kemudian ada yang bertanya lagi terkait dengan e, depolitisasi agama. Saya kira kalau masuk di dunia politik semua bisa ditarik-tarik untuk me, untuk menjadi ke politik itu ya. E, Apakah ada kaitannya? Tadi saya katakan, kalau ada orang yang memang sejak awal dia niatnya kurang bagus, bisa saja menggunakan alat bantu rumah tafid sebagai eh, niat membesarkan politik dan lain sebagainya. Tetapi sekali lagi ini bukan generalisasi. Justru saya ingin mengetengahkan, ini loh ternyata yang dulu saya husnudon saja, ternyata ada beberapa orang yang datang dalam tanda kutip tertipu dan lain sebagainya secara kualitas. Eh, kemudian bagaimana dengan eh, ternyata Tafid hanya fokus di eh, menambah dan merojaah, tidak menilai secara akhlak. Bapak-Ibu sekalian, ini eh, sebenarnya ini bukan PR besar bagi pengasuh Hafid, Hafid saja. Tetapi PR besar bagi semua kita yang terjun uh, sebagai uh, apa namanya pengelola pendidikan ya untuk mempertahankan atau untuk mem melahirkan sebuah profil yang uh, sempurna seperti seperti saya sebutkan tadi Nabi Muhammad bisa hafal dalam letter, dalam level pertama beliau sudah lulus ya hafalannya kemudian level berikutnya penguasaan pemaknaannya karena memang Allah yang mengajarkan dan pada level berikutnya adalah secara amalinya sehingga beliau dijuluki wa inna kala ala khulukin aldim di situ kemudian sahabat berusaha untuk menjadi seperti beliau sahabat nih apalagi turun ke kita tabi tabiin sampai ke kita nah, sampai ke Indonesia kita ini PR besar sehingga bagaimana cara melahirkan profil seorang hamil Quran lafdon wa maknan wa amalan ini seorang gurunya saja kesulitannya dari dari ribuan informasi dan ribuan norma-norma yang ada di Al-Qur'an apakah seorang guru itu sempurna seperti Nabi Muhammad sempurna kan juga tidak maka semuanya adalah sebuah proses sebuah proses untuk mempertahankan hamil Al-Qur'an lafdzon saja itu sulit bertahun-tahun sehingga bagaimana caranya 6200an ayat yang sudah dihafalkan itu bisa terjaga sampai mati itu juga sulit bukan main sulitnya kemudian tingkatan kedua bagaimana ayat yang sudah dihafalkan itu bisa diketahui maknanya itu juga PR besar bagi kita semua dan tidak semuanya bisa melampaui itu kemudian bagaimana yang sudah diketahui itu bisa dipraktek aplikasikan dalam sebuah kehidupan nah sekali lagi ini adalah PR besar semuanya dan eh, saya meyakini bahwasanya Seorang guru pun tidak akan sempurna 100% karena yang dijuluki insan kamil hanya Nabi Muhammad. Ya, sekali lagi, ya apa yang saya ketengahkan ini adalah bagian-bagian fenomena yang kita temukan dalam masyarakat. Dan yang negatif itulah garapan kita yang harus kita benahi supaya image negatif dari dari program Tafidil Quran itu tidak disalah artikan. Image negatif seorang Hafid Quran juga tidak diremehkan di dalam peran masyarakat dan dunia ini. Saya kira itu. Terima kasih. Oke. Okay. <tuh> Terima kasih, Bu Lili. Penjelasan yang clear sekali ya. Brief, uh, very brief. Um, <clears throat> we st we still have a time for discussion. Uh, I invite uh, another other participant 
uh, you can ask also directly uh, by raise your hand to the speakers. Uh, ada yang mau bertanya langsung silahkan dari partisipan. Boleh saya. Iya, ya, silahkan. Uh, I would like to uh, ask question uh, maybe to all the uh, presenters. Yeah? Uh, uh, maybe it is a, a naughty question. Yeah? Uh, if we would like to ask to ourselves to the to the history and the tradition of Islamic uh, heri heritage and methodology, uh, what are the missing link or the missing spot or the missing tradition in Islamic sciences in? Ulumul Quran, in Usul Pikih, in Ulumul Hadis. So today we are uh, feel uh, needed to make a reformation on the, for example, Quranic methodology or uh, Hadith methodology. Uh, what what are the missing point? Uh, that uh, this is, uh, I think, very crucial, yeah, uh, to to answer because uh, the ulama has developed uh, in each Islamic science. In Quranic studies, we have ulumul Quran. In Hadith, we have ulumul Hadis. In Pikih, we have Islamic jurisprudence, and also other Islamic sciences. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, may I respond? May, may I respond? Okay, please, Prof. Uh, please. Mashallah, <laughs> a very intriguing and very naughty question. He's right when he says that it's a naughty question. But questions are never naughty. Questions are very good and welcome. Basically, I feel that uh, when, I was, when I was listening to Brother uh, Munim and uh, some other speakers, I was feeling that we are missing somewhere the, our methodology which has been developed by our scholars. For example, when we talk about the text of Quran or the history of the Quranic text and even the language of the Quran, some foreign listeners have even questioned about the language of the Quran and as has been mentioned by uh, Dr. Munim, that uh, people say that Quran was revealed in Sarek language and such type of you know, theories are being floated by foreign lists of the Western scholars because of our not being very much aware about our own traditions which have been developed by our own classical scholars. Sometimes we just get very much swayed by such type of misquotings and misgivings of the Orientalists. We need to understand this Quranic science has been developed by Muslims and there have been great scholars of Quranic studies from Suyuti, al Khan, Fiyodomil Quran, and Zarakshi and others, they have written very marvelous books on the subject. And Quranic studies is a very detailed science developed by Muslim scholars, especially in the classical age. And we don't need to entertain such type of theories, which sometimes lead us to hermeneutics and such type of interpretation, which is needed for the biblical studies, but not at all in the Quranic studies, because Quranic sciences are that much developed by our scholars to the extent that we have al itqal fi quran That is an encyclopedic book on the Quranic sciences. Then we have al fazul Qabir by Shah al Dahlbi. Then we have Al-Burhan fi quran Zarakshis, and so many other books we have. If we rely on those sources, so far as Quranic studies is concerned, we can reply and respond all the questions raised by modern scholars especially Western scholars who want to create some suspicions in our minds about the authenticity and preservation, compilation of the Quran. So far as Hadith is concerned, about Hadith, as has been said by Montgomery Ward, that only Muslims have their detailed historiography and they have the biographies of about two lakh people. 
And hadith is such a dialogue of science and the criticism of hadith and other sciences, asma urujal, charawatadi, that is also well developed science. But I feel that our modern scholars, and sometimes we included, are not well acquainted with our own traditions or in these sciences. So sometimes we try to compromise with the actual status of these sciences. If we are well grounded in our own legacy and our thoughts, so far these sciences are concerned, then we will be able in a better way to respond all challenges as we have Mustafa Azmi and such other scholars who have responded to some of the orientalist theories, which were just questioning the authenticity of the Quran or its preservation or its linguistic you know, tools. And also they were just questioning on whether Quran was edited by one person or two persons. So it is not any such book which can be edited. There is a good record of this whole history of Quran, preservation of the Quran. So it is not any other book like that. So Quran is the most authentic book in that sense, which has been acknowledged by the, you know, uh, just, just scholars of the West. Even. So my point here is that there are not missing links in this way, but there is problem with modern scholarship of Islam that mostly Muslims, they are not well acquainted, well aware about our own legacy, our own heritage, our own, you know, classical, literature on Quranic studies, Hadith studies. If we get acquainted with that literature, then we can just not find any lacking so far as the historical links of these all saints are concerned. Lastly, so far as fiqh is concerned, Muslims have developed fiqh to the extent that we have all the canonical books found from all the schools. And such a great work has been done. It may be Risal, Risal Um, or it may be a Risala, other Kitab al Um, or a Risala of Shafi, or Fiqh Akbar of you know, you know, Hanfi, or Abu Hanifa, and it may be Mauta and other such books, and then the books written by Ghazali and other scholars on Usul Fiqh and Fiqh. So we have such a rich literature uh, in Fiqh uh, as well, and we can find all the question replies and the responses to modern challenges if we just go back to our literature and there is no such problem which we find in other cases of the denominations so far as their basic scriptures are concerned. So this is my take that we need to make our new generations and scholars aware about our legacy in these sciences and master the language in which that treasure of knowledge is found, whether it relates to Quran or Hadith or Fiqh. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Prof. Hamidullah. Uh, you have response, uh, uh, Prof. Kusmana question. Uh, I give, uh, I give the time for Mr. Munim uh, or yeah, Papa Isok. Okay, maybe just briefly. Um, so I, I'm really delighted to see that uh, Brother Hamidullah, you know, uh, refer and use, uh, you know, Western scholarship to support his his view. Uh, but the problem is that he only, you know, use some of those views that that seem to, uh, you know, agree with his own. So uh, we should know that uh, in in the Western scholarship there is a diversity of views. There, there is a diversity of perspective. What makes Quranic studies is so lively and, and vibrant in the, the Western academia because everything is subject to debate. You know, there is nothing that is, you know, accepted at best value, but rather everything is subject to discussion, to debate, and there is no monolithic view in Western scholarship. So the views like, you know, uh, the one that I mentioned earlier, Luxembourg view has been criticized by Western scholars. Um, so that what make you know uh, the scholarship is so vibrant. So we do not just refer to what we like to know, but rather, you know, we we, we need to address those those views. Um, either we agree or disagree. The second point that I like to highlight is that how do we uh, you know uh, uh, um, um, use our own traditions? It seems like. You know everything coming from the past should be accepted as just value i think that is one of the problems that we have today we tend to accept the tradition at best value rather than 
you know, trying to rethink, you know, the the value of the tradition itself. So yes, our uh, our ulama have developed, uh, you know, uh, uh, quite um, uh, rich uh, traditions in each in each field of sciences, in Quranic studies, in hadith, in fiqh, in kalam, and so forth. But I don't think that we have to accept all those, um, you know, um, uh, developments um, without any critical view. So, um, so, so the, the way we, um, you know, we attach ourselves to the tradition, uh, you know, uh, shape, um, you know, uh, or, 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 or maybe not, not just shape, but rather. Um, become what what we are today so the reason why you know for instance the the, the field of quranic studies is is seem to be stagnant in our islamic universities because we tend to approach the quran from dogmatic point of view rather than from critical point of view so, okay bro. can i respond can i respond oh, I just yeah. <laughs> It will be interesting. Yeah. Okay. Uh, basically, uh, basically, we can't call it dogmatic because we have to understand that there is difference. So far as uh, our belief is, because although there is belief also, there is scholarship also. But as a Muslim, I find that uh, a Muslim approaches to Quran not a Christian, as a Christian approaches to Bible. Historically speaking, as you know better, that there are so many versions of Bible and even the language has been not preserved. But so far as Quran is concerned, historically speaking, it has been preserved. Even the language is preserved. Karl Armstrong says that when a Muslim reads Quran, he reads the words of God. But when a Christian reads the Bible, he reads words of someone else and he does not know. Says no, you know, Karl Armstrong. So we have to understand this you know, fact. That's very important. Sometimes we treat Quran as we treat Bible or other books. As it is not only a matter of belief, it's also a matter of research as well. We have to take a vantage point that Quran has been preserved and there is historical background there with us. How we can ignore that? And we will apply the Western methodology on Quran and where there is no authenticity found in the books, historically speaking. Whereas we believe that Quran has been authenticated and there has been a good scholarship from the time of Prophet Sallallahu onwards till date. And good literature has been produced on the subject. And we do need even to go for the hermetical understanding of the Quran because we have already developed a system about that. For example, Ibn Kasir, he has used making understanding of Quran possible by the Quran itself. Al-Quran, So he has used that. And other scholars as well. In modern times also, Muhammad Ayyub, and there are people like Sar Sayyid Ahmad Khan, and then uh, Hussein Nasr, and the Mullah Maududi, and so many other scholars, they have also worked on these subjects and uh -huh. Majad Diriya Badi of India. And they have taken cognizance of modern challenges, but they have not taken that position as a Christian takes you know, with suspicion and doubt. And he applies the methods which have been developed by the atheists or the materialists who don't believe in the authenticity of the books. How we can accept that methodology when we are dealing with a scripture like Quran? We may take some clues from that. But we should not apply that without any you know, qualification. So we have to be very much careful. Otherwise, we will make Quran also, as people have made their own books. But they had problems with their books. But we do have, as, as a Muslim, we believe that Quran has been preserved and it has been authenticated, not only by Muslims, but many scholars. But when we take the position of those people who have doubted scriptures, and they want to also apply the same standards of uh, criticism on Quran, then they can create more and more misconceptions in the minds of Muslims. But Muslims should understand that our tradition is preserved and our book is more secure so far as its historical connectivity is concerned. And it has been interpreted, reinterpreted from very beginning till date. And there has been no time when Quran has been not evaluated by its own scholars. And we do need to adopt always the Western methodologies to judge Quranic value and its authenticity. This is my assumption. Thank. Okay. <laughs> uh, discuss. Uh, and the rest and uh, from Pak uh, Yusuf Rahman, uh, uh, maybe he want to ask the question. Please, uh, Pak Yusuf. 
Terima kasih. Uh, sebetulnya tadi sudah saya tanyakan di chat, tapi belum sempat direspon. Ini terkait dengan presentasi Prof. Moon Im bahwa uh, pertanyaan can a believer be a critical scholar? Uh, nah tadi Mas Moon Im menyampaikan contoh-contoh uh, seperti Asma Hilali, Behnam Siddiqui yang di Barat itu memang mengkaji secara kritis. Nah, saya merujuk kepada bukunya Majid Danishgar yang berjudul Studying the Quran in Muslim Academy yang tesisnya adalah bahwa kajian Al-Quran di negara-negara Muslim itu lebih bersifat apologetik yang tujuannya adalah untuk mempertahankan ortodoksi dan lain-lain dan tidak bisa diklaim sebagai kajian akademik. Nah, saya ingin bagaimana respon uh, Mas Munim terhadap tesis dari Majid dan Lesker tersebut. Uh, kenapa uh, tidak mungkin atau agak susah untuk kajian akademik uh, di negara-negara Muslim untuk kajian-kajian Al-Quran dan bagaimana ini bisa dikembangkan. Kalau seandainya Mas Munim berada tinggalnya di Indonesia, saya yakin ini bisa bisa berkembang di Indonesia. Tapi karena Mas Munim di Amerika Serikat, jadi agak susah ini uh, bisa dikembangkan. Saya kira itu. Uh, saya mohon uh, komentar dari Mas Munim. Terima kasih. Ya, silakan Mas Munim. Ya, terima kasih Mas Yusuf. Iya, saya, saya kira secara umum uh, tesis Majid dan Iskandar itu benar ya bahwa ada kecenderungan di kalangan umat Islam di dunia Islam untuk mendekati kitab suci kita itu secara dogmatis gitu. Dan uh, dan kesan bahwa segalanya sudah selesai dengan Al-Qur'an jadi tidak perlu dibicarakan lagi gitu. Bahkan ketika uh, mendekati Al-Qur'an sebagai literatur pun kita langsung mengatakan bahwa Al-Quran itu adalah sastra terbaik gitu. Nggak ada yang melebihi sastra Al-Quran. Jadi pertama kali yang kita kedepankan itu adalah uh, pendekatan iman. Saya kira itu, itu, itu saya kira yang menjadi, uh, apa namanya, yang menjadikan uh, studi Quran di kita itu pendekatannya memang dogmatis, apologetik gitu. Karena, karena pertama, Al-Quran dianggap selesai gitu, jadi sejarahnya tidak perlu dibicarakan lagi, sejarah teksnya harus diterima apa adanya, dan kontennya itu tidak perlu di apa ya, tidak perlu diotak atik gitu, karena itu kan kita sering mendengar orang mengatakan Al-Quran itu semuanya mudah gitu, mudah dipaham, ngapain kita perlu susah-susah gitu, padahal itu kan semua yang 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 kita sebutkan itu itu kebalikan dari kenyataan gitu. Kita mengatakan Al-Qur'an mudah, kenyataannya sulit dipaham gitu. Kita mengatakan Al-Qur'an itu proses transmisinya tidak perlu dibicarakan, tapi ternyata sumber-sumber Islam sendiri membuka ruang untuk membicarakan kembali gitu. Nah, saya kira Mas Yusuf um, apa yang perlu dilakukan saya kira yang pertama adalah Uh, apa namanya memperkenalkan pendekatan sejarah ke dalam studi Quran. Nah kita sudah di Indonesia itu mencoba mendekati Al Quran kan secara sosiologis ya. Dulu diperkenalkan oleh Pak Harun Nasution dan uh, apa namanya teman-teman yang awal yang sekolah di Barat pulang ke Indonesia mendekati Al Quran itu secara sosiologis gitu mencari misalnya dengan pengaruh Rahman ya. Uh, mencari elan dasarnya apa faktor sosiologisnya itu, itu kan sudah diperkenalkan oleh generasi Pak Harun Nasution oleh generasi pembaru 80-an 90-an gitu nah saya kira saatnya sekarang mus, uh, apa, kita memperkenalkan uh, pendekatan sejarah terhadap terhadap Al-Quran uh, dan ini yang saya kira masih masih lacking ya masih lemah dalam dalam tradisi kesarjanaan Quran di kita gitu karena kalau implikasinya gitu ketika persoalan Quran dianggap selesai sejarahnya sudah selesai apapun yang kita bicarakan tentang Al-Quran itu menjadi sangat sensitif gitu dan dan kita tahu kan bagaimana orang bereaksi kalau kalau kita berbicara tentang sejarah yang belum selesai reaksinya itu langsung negatif gitu um, kita juga tahu apa yang terjadi 
pada beberapa sarjana Arab ya seperti Nasr Hamid Abu Zaid misalnya Syahrur ya yang mencoba menafsirkan kembali Quran gitu dengan perspektif yang lebih historis melacak kata-kata Quran yang dilakukan Syahrur itu reaksi dengan sangat keras kan kita tahu Nasr Hamid Abu Zaid dibawa ke pengadilan di, dianggap murtad kemudian hingga harus tinggal di luar negeri kita tahu tentang apa yang terjadi ketika Seseorang mencoba untuk melakukan rethinking terhadap Quran gitu. Nah saya kira Pak Mas Susub, karena pendekatan sosiologis sudah diperkenalkan tahun 80-an, 90-an. Saya kira saatnya pendekatan historis saya kira yang perlu. Dan ini yang saya coba lakukan, perkenalkan dengan uh, beberapa uh, yang saya tulis adalah memperkenalkan pendekatan yang lebih historis gitu. Uh, ini, ini memang ikhtiar saya karena pendekatan sosiologis sudah, di, sudah dicoba. Saatnya saya kira kita mencoba pendekatan uh, yang yang historis sehingga uh, beberapa aspek dari Quran itu kita rethinking gitu dalam upaya juga lebih memahami kontennya kan. Uh, saya khawatir apa namanya karena ini kajian yang sangat intens di barat gitu. Saya khawatir yang saya khawatirkan adalah kita umat Islam itu tidak tahu sejarah Quran kita sendiri gitu. Malah kita kaget, bereaksi keras, negatif ketika mendengar apa yang dikatakan oleh orang-orang barat sekarang. Nah, karena itu saya kira di Indonesia terutama, di UIN, saya kira pendekatan historis terhadap, terhadap Quran itu mulai harus mulai digencarkan. Ini, 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 ini yang, yang, uh, yang apa, ingin saya coba kontribusikan. Terima kasih Mas Yusuf uh, pertanyaannya dan juga teman-teman uh, semua yang hadir pada uh, pagi ini. Terima kasih. Ya, terima kasih Prof. Muntin. Uh, maaf, mungkin ada dari Bapak Dr. Muhammad Zulfahmi respon atau apa, silakan. Uh, dari tadi saya, ya, Pak Kusmana ada nyinggung juga tadi, for all participant, uh, speakers. Oke, okay. uh, mungkin cukup ya, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, kita sampai kita sampai pada akhir uh, diskusi kita pada siang hari ini. Uh, saya saya mengambil kesimpulan bahwa betul yang dikatakan. Uh, Speaker tadi bahwa studi Al-Quran uh, DKD terakhir ini uh, masuk kepada Golden Age ya. Ada perkembangan dengan seiring dengan uh, banyaknya pendekatan ya. Majunya pendekatan yang dilakukan uh, terhadap studi Al-Quran. Untuk itu ini uh, membuka ruang bagi kita uh, khususnya uh, sekular, uh, Quran dan hadis sekular yang ada di Indonesia misalnya untuk uh, melihat bagaimana sih uh, perkembangan atau dinamika area studi bahasa Pak Munim tadi yang berkembang di, di dunia luar. Uh, saya mohon maaf, uh, saya terima kasih banyak kepada all speakers for your uh, presentation and answer the question dan juga kepada semua partisipan. Uh, saya tutup uh, dengan mengucapkan hamdalah Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Thank you very much Iya Terima kasih banyak semua teman-teman Terima uh, kasih baik. mas Mohon perhatiannya Hadirin sekalian sebelum acara ini tutup Ada penyerahan sertifikat secara simbolis Secara virtual ya tentunya secara online Boleh panitia dipersiapkan Terima kasih Terima kasih. Thank you very much for uh, giving this chance, very rare chance. Thank you very much. Allah. It is for Professor Hamidullah. Yeah, mashallah, you have said it. <laughs> we will send it uh, to you, but uh, hmm. officially we share on screen. Ah, so Mashallah. Mashallah. Thank you very much, Prof. Hamidullah, for your welcome, welcome, sir. 
uh, presentation. And the next one is for Professor Munim Siri. Terima kasih, Mas Munim. Uh, nah, this one. <laughs> yep. Ya, terima kasih. Mungkin kalau di Indonesia ini bisa dipakai untuk BKD, Pak. <laughs> Oke, okay, selanjutnya untuk uh, Bu Lili. Uh, Bu Lili. Nah, terima kasih Bu Lili uh, untuk ke guru besar ini nanti. Amin. Selanjutnya untuk uh, Dr. Zulfahmi. Nah, ini untuk Dr. Muhammad Zulfahmi, uh, kolega kita di USAS. Terima kasih. Dr. Zulfahmi, selanjutnya untuk Bu Saadah, our lecturer, uh, ya, yeah, this is Bu Dr. Saadah Tuljannah, uh, PhD candidate. Dan terakhir untuk MC kita, eh, moderator kita, Bapak Dr. Novizal. Terima kasih sudah memimpin acara panel kita pada pagi hingga siang hari ini. Thank you very much for you all. Yeah. Marshall, thank you. So, thank and you. we need also some meeting among ourselves, uh, Munim and you people, and we have more detailed discussion on the subject, inshallah. Okay. Thank you. So, we hope That's you... so nice. Uh, at one thirty, we will have a parallel session. Yeah, uh, if some of you if some of you can join the parallel session and the link has been uh, shared thank you but that may be that may be that may be basha basha <laughs> okay ya terima kasih bagi bapak ibu yang ingin bergabung dalam parallel session nanti insyaallah kita akan lanjutkan pada jam 1.30 terima kasih semuanya terima kasih mas munim prof amidullah Pak Zulfahmi, Bu Lili, Bu Saadah, dan Pak Novizal Wendri. Ya, terima kasih Pak. Oh, screenshot terakhir untuk para pembicara. Uh, mau dikumpulkan semuanya, mudah-mudahan masih ada. Uh, Pak Midullah masih ada di sana? Oke, okay, Pak Novizal, Bu Saadah. Oke, okay, Pak Zulfahmi. Pak Hamidullah, ini Pak Mas Munim di sana udah jam satu pagi nih. <laughs> Oke, okay, satu lagi Pak Zul Pahmi. Oke, okay, silakan di screenshot. Oke, okay, silakan di screenshot. Siapa yang screenshot? Oh, Pak Rahmat sudah. Oke, okay, one, two, three. Oke, okay. thank you very much. Terima kasih semuanya. Ya, yeah. Ya. Yeah.